order. This is the uh, Wednesday, December 9th, 2020 meeting of the Lowell Conservation Commission. Uh, our order of business starts with continued business in the form of an enforcement order that we had given out to dual state investments of Littleton the violation location is 25 Clifton Street. And there was fill dumping and storage of construction materials in the 100 year floodplain out there. Uh, we, we did try to make clear the last time that uh, we spoke with uh, the people from Clifton Street that uh, we wanted to uh, have a uh, notice of intent or further information in any case submitted and we haven't received anything. And we've also got notification that there is still fill. And uh, of course we said stop work, that's understandable, but uh, that there is uh, activity out there. So uh, is there someone here from dual state tonight? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Kenneth Laney, of Cornerstone Land Associates, representing Dual State this evening. How are you, Louise? Fine. How good, are good. You? I'm doing fine. Louise, I, uh, I did have an opportunity just today. I was able to track down some old materials that I emailed over to Fran. Uh, ultimately, this property was part of a LOMA uh, letter of map amendment. That was done in 2018 by Leo White and Ron Close. And ultimately the topography that was done on the property, um, again, I did provide that to Fran, um, you know, very late this evening, um, or should I say this afternoon, but ultimately it shows the floodplain at elevation 104, topography was done and a plan was submitted to the uh, FEMA agency as part of the LOMA application. And it was uh, approved by FEMA on uh, April 1st, 2019. And I did provide Fran that letter of map amendment determination uh, approval as well. So ultimately I, I did have the chance to review the plan, Louise, and, and it does look like that all the fill work and anything uh, that was done on that lot is outside of the FEMA 100 year floodplain elevation of 104. And um, I believe that if you guys have a chance to review that information that I provided you, that you would see that in fact, it is outside of the 100 year floodplain. And uh, I would I would presume not jurisdictional under this enforcement order. Well, unfortunately, I haven't seen any of, of uh, that new material. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if it's up on the website yet or not. I, I don't see it there. Um, and, uh, you know, we we have, you know, more than one. Uh, uh, who did you say was had determined that the floodplain was at 104? Yep. Uh, so the actual map determines the elevation at 104 because um, it is a zone AE, Louisa. But um, ultimately, the work that was done for the letter of map amendment was done by Leo White and Ron Close. Uh, they've been pretty much lifelong engineers and surveyors in the city of Lowell for quite some time. Um, that work was done in 2018 for the prior owner. Uh, since then, the lot was subdivided by that owner and then sold to the current owner um, that I believe the, the uh, enforcement order was issued to. So it took a little bit of time to track down that information. I apologize for the uh, late uh, submission. And I don't mind if the board or the commission wishes to uh, continue the hearing for another two weeks, give you folks an opportunity to review that information. And then ultimately, I think it'd be best if I went out there and actually staked the 104 contour for you folks so that we can you know, all be sure that none of the fill work that was done falls within that contour. Well, uh, so did they do an actual uh, survey on the ground to, to determine that 104? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And uh, the problem that I see is that the fill has uh, pretty much been spread around and now we've got snow on top of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to get down to the actual level, I, I appreciate that you'll go out and check that. 
but to get well, it's to not the that, actual it's level, not, uh, I don't know if that's going to be possible at, at this time. Well, ultimately, I wouldn't be checking the level, um, Madam Chair. What I would be doing is uh, identifying with points on the original plan completed by Ron and Leo um, where the contour line is. And I can just go out and stake the contour line. I don't actually have to know what the actual elevation is on the ground because I have it physically in AutoCAD on the computer. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Um, yes, I, you know, I am, uh, I certainly would want to see the, the documents that you've submitted before, you know, taking uh, any action and making any uh, statements tonight. Uh, yes, do we have questions from the board about this? I have a question. Did we, um, so the work continued after our last meeting, correct? Um, I'm unsure of that answer I, I actually just recently got involved two days ago yeah no um, work can so, no work has continued can so i apologize uh, i've i've heard that no work was continued in that area that is that is what i've been told okay thanks hey, Kim, what about over the next two weeks you know or i should say until the next me I, I i like what you're suggesting in terms of a plan of going out and staking you know, the contour line and giving us an opportunity to verify. Absolutely. Um, but uh, our next meeting wouldn't be until mm -hmm. I think it's January 13th or something like that. I mean, it's not until the second Wednesday in January. Um, my, so my question is, is there any planned work between now and that next meeting? Um, because obviously it becomes a moot point if we verify what you're this saying. Is and with it. But um, it puts oh. in an awkward position to kind of have work going with an open enforcement order without having the opportunity to kind of verify, you know, what information you found. I, I completely understand. It is my understanding that there's no exterior work to be done on the outside of the property. Currently, I believe that the gentleman that owns the existing dwelling that added yes. addition added on to it is just solely working on interior fit up, completing that work. There could be some exterior work on the structure itself, but there will be no more groundwork being done on the outside. All right. So, you know, I guess for my fellow commission members, you know, after we're done talking about this, I'd be open mm -hmm. to continuing this um, agenda until the next meeting to give us an opportunity to verify uh, what um, what Mr. Lanya found, and, and if we if we concur with the findings, then I would say at that point, we rescind the order and because it's outside of the jurisdictional boundary. But I'm not like Louise, or I'm not prepared to make that decision now without looking at the information. Yeah, and, and that's completely understandable. And that was the reason for my suggestion for the two week or well, whatever the next meeting continuance is. It, it will actually give me some time, Bill, to get out there and, and stake that contour that Ron and uh, Leo had determined. And, you know, then I can do a little check on my own as well. You know what I mean? So I, I haven't been out there to survey the property as of yet, but I did obtain the, you know, information from, you know, Leo and uh, Peter Maloney. So we do have the opportunity for me to actually identify the points on the AutoCAD, go out, stake it, and ultimately I can define that line for everybody. And I had already suggested to the client that we put up a, once I know where that line is and we stake it, we get some waddles uh, installed there and some construction fencing put up that orange kind of construction fencing. So that way it, it defines exactly where it is so there can be no further work beyond those two items. Um, and that should hopefully make everybody comfortable as that project moves forward in the spring. All right, thanks for that. Before we proceed, I think we have a request for a public comment. Uh, Denise has raised her hand. Uh, let's uh, see if anyone else from the commission would like to say something before we go there. Okay. Okay. Uh, Denise, I know you spoke at one of our last meetings. You're in the bottom, I believe. Uh, do I have to unmute or... Joe, is that something you do? She's unmuted okay. now. Denise, do you have something you'd like to say? Yes, 7 Clifton Street. It's a, they're lying that they said they haven't done anything on the property. They filled in even further closer to our property. And then last week, they had a big truck over in the back end where it's all wetlands. And it was sunk in halfway through. The tires were halfway in the ground. They couldn't get it out. They had to get it pulled out. 
So when they keep saying they're doing nothing on the property, they continue to keep filling it in. Okay, well, we were pretty clear that there was to be no work and obviously the fill was our major concern. So uh, I sent the pictures think, uh, in to Fran. Fran has the pictures. She was supposed to give the pictures to the committee. We did get some pictures. Uh, I, I, I think perhaps the, uh, uh, the conservation office can uh, either contact or, or uh, we can send word through Mr. Lania tonight that, uh, you know, no work means no work. It doesn't mean, you know, not constructing the house. It means no work. And, and that's going to continue for at least another month because we don't have another meeting until the second week of January, as Bill pointed out. Uh, oh, if, I, if I can address that comment, I'm, I'm the applicant, um, the, the neighbor next door that's building the home, my director butter, his dumpster got stuck and that was his way out of the back to the, the neighboring property. He goes, do you mind if I just um, make the corner and come onto your property? And it was outside the, uh, is a what? he could not make it by. And I said, sure, you can drive over my to exit his property. And he got stuck. I, I was not doing any work to our lot, obviously, because of Can the- Can I say uh, something? Yes. Um, I, I saw those pictures and it, to me, it looked like there had been more fill than the original pictures. That's just coming from my perspective. I've seen yeah. uh, the pictures that were provided uh, a couple months ago compared to the pictures now. And it looks like there has been some work done since our last meeting. Yeah, it has not though. I mean, I have pictures too, but the vehicle that got stuck was the neighbor doing, I, I should have said you shouldn't have been able to cut over my yard, but he didn't, he got stuck. I was only trying to help him out because he couldn't exit on the other side, he said. Yeah. Uh, even if we determine that you're out of the 100 year flood yeah, plane, you're hmm. within 100 feet of a resource and we definitely don't want fill being brought in without our approval. Yeah. So uh, any fill that's in there, in my mind, is, is subject to being taken out of there. So I wouldn't get too comfortable about, you know, nope. having, having it there or, or spreading it around to just make it harder to remove if that is the determination that we make. Yeah. So uh, uh, I I didn't get your last name, John. Oh, name? it's John Fineris. Uh, Fineris. Uh, so we're we're postponing any any uh, determination on this. It, it, there's already an enforcement order, which means that we expect that uh, no work will be done of, of any type. Yeah, I, I agree and I've already told the neighbor just do not come onto the property, do not do anything because of this. Don't don't store a dumpster, don't do don't come near the line because I guess last week he had a trailer that was three feet onto my yard. I says please don't even have any equipment, nothing on it. So he, okay. he does know that loud and clear. Well, you might want to put up one of those orange fences on that particular uh, property line if that's uh, going to be a, a concern. Uh, so uh, I think we're we're clear on on what we're expecting. That uh, we're going to look over the materials that you've submitted. Uh, Ms. Solani is going to go out and and uh, mark off uh, the 104 foot line, which has been determined as the uh, edge of the floodplain. And uh, at our next meeting, we'll be here to discuss this again. Meanwhile, uh, you know we're open to. Uh, any submissions uh, that may come along, uh, either from the proponent or, or from uh, a butters, in order to get a complete picture of, uh, of the situation out there. Uh, so this will be postponed until, is it the 13th of January, the second Wednesday, you said? Yeah, I just verified that, Louisa. The second Wednesday is the 13th mm -hmm. of January. So if we could have you uh, back here, Mr. Pinaris, and uh, if Mr. Yes. Lanier is, is uh, in charge of uh, something, he as well, and, and uh, we can discuss it at that time. I would like to have all of the submissions well before the meeting so we can look them over. Uh, yes, ma'am. Louise, thank you very much, members of the commission. Thank you. And uh, I'll get that work done 
within the next two weeks, definitely prior to Christmas, I'll have that staked out and we'll get that orange construction fencing up so that uh, there's no confusion with the neighbor. Thank you. Okay, perhaps you could just notify the office when that's done and then we can uh, take a look ourselves. Yes, I will send Fran photographs and an email once it's completed. Okay, well, thank you for coming in and- uh, Excellent. We appreciate thank you. you. And you folks have a great Christmas. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Well. You as well. Thank you. Good night. Okay, moving along on our agenda. We have new business, a request for a certificate of compliance uh, presented by the Flood Law Office uh, for DEP file number 2060607. The project location is 50 Phoenix Ave. Now this particular project uh, uh, was uh, is quite quite a few years old, and the certificates, uh, I mean the uh, order is no longer valid, and the work was never started. So uh, I have seen that this is the way you uh, deal with it: is we can't have it just lying around open. Uh, so even though the work was never completed or started. Uh, we need to uh, just uh, issue a certificate that perhaps uh, references that situation that uh, work was never started and uh, the certificate doesn't indicate that the work was completed in compliance. Anyone like to make a motion to that effect? I can make a motion to grant a certificate of compliance for uh, this project for which work was never uh, proceeded with completed. I'll second it. Okay, we have a, a motion made and second. Is there someone here that would like to speak regarding this? Is there someone representing the uh, proponent? Okay, here Hello, we this is attorney Catherine Flood. I'm here on behalf of the owner of 50 Phoenix Ave pertaining to our request for a certificate of compliance. Okay, and are you also uh, represent, um, never mind, <laughs> that's a beavers. Okay, so 50 uh, Phoenix Ave, uh, is there any, uh, is this a project that's still in the works, like to come back later on, or do you think it's just uh, uh, dropped completely? So they were in back in 2007, and I think the intent at that point was to construct a building on the lot. The lot is just a vacant piece of land and there's no intention at this time to construct anything on it. Okay. All right. And certainly if there is some kind of a future uh, uh, application, uh, we can deal with it at that time. Thank you for explaining that. Thank uh, you. We've had a motion made and seconded. Uh, if there's no further discussion from the board, we can have a, a vote here. All those in favor? Aye. 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 A uh, unanimous vote uh, in favor of issuing the certificate of compliance. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Flood, and uh, have a good evening. You too. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night. Bye. Next, we have an emergency certification. It's actually the same location as uh, the one we were just speaking about, 50 to 55 Phoenix Ave. City of Lowell has requested a certification to allow a small breach of the beaver dam to allow water to flow and abate the flooding emergency resulting from recent rain events and continued beaver activity. Uh, I would like to emphasize a small breach on this because uh, uh, in the course of investigating a nearby uh, a property that we had on our agenda some months ago, uh, I was amazed at how uh, natural and really uh, functional this particular little uh, uh, wetland was. You know, there was a beaver dam in the middle of it, but there were uh, numerous uh, types of birds and you know, very, very quiet and pleasant and everybody looked happy. I, I wouldn't like to see uh, uh, the complete system really messed with too much as far as lowering the water a little, I can see why that might be necessary, but uh, 
you know, without the water, you also don't have the wildlife or or the uh, the plant life that are out there right now. It's really quite a, a pleasant little area. Is there anyone here, uh, Joe, are you representing, did you say, on this? No, I'm not on this one. No, is there someone here from the city that would like to uh, speak? Okay, uh, any uh, questions or comments from the board? No. So is this is this a re, this seems to be a recurring issue? Uh, I would think it was a returning issue because beavers never rest. Exactly. Um, I, I was just going to throw it out there. Uh, maybe some sort of beaver deceiver or something along that lines to maybe um, revert them away from building a dam in that specific area or. Well, it's a fairly small dam. Uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, you can see it from the road. And uh, I don't know if a, a large construction project would even fit in that area. Um, just keeping an eye on it, perhaps this might be all that's needed. Um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there if it's going to be a recurring issue. Right, right. I, I think the beavers have been there for quite some time. Um, I think due to its visibility and, and um, size, we'll be fine keeping our eye on it and moving forward as, uh, as you've outlined, Louisa. Yeah, I did appreciate the drawing that was submitted with the uh, materials that showed uh, and emphasized a small breach just to lower the water level somewhat. And of course the beavers will attempt to to uh, repair that so uh, uh, you know it, it's something that you you have to keep an eye on is there a motion on this I'll pull off for a motion to uh, grant this emergency certification at the request of the applicant okay motion made seconded by I'll, I'll second, second it Harry oh. uh, and Weston uh, <laughs> Brad <laughs> all those in favor Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next we have a, a, a request for an extension of an order of conditions. DEP file number 2060776. This is a, a project by the City of Lowell, 350.4 Dutton Street. It's an extension of the uh, order that we gave out to the Hamilton Canal District parking garage. And they're asking for a one year extension until January 25th, 2022. Uh, they were back in here, I believe quite recently uh, requesting uh, a change along the canal side so that there could be better, uh, I think it was better uh, pedestrian circulation through there and they're looking for grant money, I believe. Is there someone here from the city to uh, represent this? So this is finally Joe's uh, Joe's time to shine, but this is Justin Mosca from VHB. I'm, uh, I'm working with oh, Joe as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we, uh, we were th before you in August um, to permit a canal walk um, along the side of the gar garage, um, along the lower Pawtucket, as well as the, uh, the tail race that goes along the east side. Uh, that is under construction currently for some of the, I'll call it the bones that we can get in under the current funding that's remaining in the garage. Uh, the city is still trying to um, gather funding to complete all the improvements we want to do. Um, but rather than our, um, our order is, is set to expire this January. So rather than letting that lapse, we'd like to just stay under those conditions, um, extend that till next January so we can come back there's there's also they're finishing up construction now on on the majority of the work on site uh, but it's past the planting season so we also have to come back in the spring and do some of the plantings in the spring um, so generally speaking we're just going to be beyond the uh the anticipated time we were originally thinking was going to finish up this fall but uh since we're not done we're hoping to extend the order okay that all makes sense to me and uh uh you know i'm in i'm in favor do we have a motion or any questions first 
I, I'll just make a comment. It's nice to see how that project's progressing. And I think that's a reasonable request to extend the order of conditions. Okay. I'll make a motion to extend the order of conditions. Okay, for a period of time. Uh, they asked for one year. Uh, for one year. Okay, uh, seconded by? Weston. Weston, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Mosca, for coming by. Great, thank you all very much. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Okay, next we have uh, a request for a determination of applicability uh, from uh, Matt Lalone, uh, care of HEG for 1148 Bridge Street, LLC. Uh, the project location is 1148 Bridge Street. This is a request for determination of applicability uh, to convert an existing restaurant building at 1148 Bridge Street into a recreational marijuana dispensary. Portions of the site are within the 100 foot buffer zone of bordering vegetative wetlands. This is uh, one of the uh, most unusual wetlands I think we have in Lowell. Uh, you might walk by there and say, where's the wetland? We did have another property just this past summer that that was in violation of that particular wetland. It's uh, it's small and, and uh, almost intermittent, but it's pretty important to, uh, to the area. Um, is there someone here uh, presenting this? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Tamula. I'm a project manager with Green and Peterson out of Salem, New Hampshire. Uh, and I'm here on behalf of uh, HEG 1148 Bridge Street LLC um, for the RDA application that we submitted uh, to the city. Um, so if the, if, uh, the chair would uh, allow me, I'd like to share my screen um, so I can kind of walk through uh, the plans, give the commission a brief overview of what we're looking to do, uh, show the limits of uh, the buffer zone, where the wetlands are, et cetera. Sure. Okay, one second. All right, uh, does everybody see the plan uh, on the screen right now? Yes. Yep. All right, um, so as you, as you mentioned, uh, the property is located at 1148 Bridge Street. Uh, for reference, the Hafner's uh, gas station is located on the right-hand side here. AutoZone is located to the left here and the market basket is across the street, uh, across Bridge Street. Uh, the wetlands uh, that we're looking at is the wetlands that are located with this yellow line here. Um, we did not flag the wetlands uh, based on my discussion with Fran. Uh, we took the wetlands based on the, uh, the MassGIS database uh, as the wetlands were off our property and obviously we did not have the ability to flag them. Um, but the associated wetland buffer uh, is shown in blue uh, the 100 foot buffer line comes along uh, in through here. Um, the, the site, uh, as you mentioned, the site's currently uh, fully developed. It's a former uh, pizza shop and uh, Chinese food restaurant. Uh, it is about 8,400 square feet in size and it's located in the regional retail uh, district, uh, zoning district. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the whole site is basically developed. Uh, there's a paved parking lot in the front of the site here with 10 parking spaces. Uh, the pavement goes into the back uh, along through here with a, uh, a retaining wall that runs along the back of the property and down the side of the property with a, uh, a gated off uh, area here. And there's also another retaining wall located along uh, the left-hand side of the property here. Uh, there are existing utilities obviously on site uh, consisting of um, gas, water, sewer, uh, and it should be uh, known that there's no stormwater management on site. Everything either runs across the site to the right and then ultimately uh, down towards, uh, towards Bridge Street. Um, what my client is looking to do is redevelop the property uh, into an adult use marijuana establishment um, for, the, uh, for the, essentially most of the work is, is happening uh, within the building uh, with minor improvements uh, on the site. Uh, we received our special permit and site plan approval from the city uh, this past Monday night and we're hoping for a negative determination uh, from the commission uh, this evening. From a proposed uh, point of view, proposed development point of view, as I mentioned, um, most of the work is taking place within the building. 
Uh, there's a, a new building facade uh, that's being uh, proposed. We are restriping the front parking lot here. Uh, there are currently 10 parking spaces that are all angled spaces, which you can see in the light gray here. Um, they don't meet zoning. Uh, so what we tried to do is um, restripe the parking lot to meet zoning, uh, which we currently do. We're now proposing uh, six parking spaces, uh, one of which is an ADA accessible parking space here. We are providing a striped uh, access way from the building entrance here all the way up to Bridge Street which will promote uh, an ADA accessible uh, route, as well as the ability to have a, a bike rack located to the left-hand side here, which will provide um, anybody uh, taking a bike uh, to, the, to the facility um, and place their bike here. Um, but from the Conservation Commission's point of view, uh, again, the 100-foot buffer runs along this dash line here. Um, within the buffer zone, uh, there is, um, Within this dash line on site, there's approximately 3,870 square feet of actual area within the buffer zone. Um, of that, there's about 2,700 square feet is the existing building located here. And the, there's about 870 square feet of, uh, in, of uh, impervious uh, area otherwise, uh, which consists of the, the parking lot that's lo lo located in here and a small portion of the uh, existing um, sidewalk. Work within the buffer zone uh, will really just uh, entail resurfacing the parking lot. Uh, the parking lot's in pretty poor condition, so they're just going to resurface the parking lot. Uh, there'll be two uh, proposed rolling dumpsters located back here, and they're taking down the existing uh, rundown fence and providing a new uh, security fence um, with the gated manway access door and, and access point um, right here. So other than that, um, there's really no work within the, the 100 foot buffer zone. Like I said, it's, it's mainly just upgrading the, uh, the rundown pavement. Um, the, the entire site is curbed and a retaining wall is in through here as well. So there'll be no impact to the, uh, to the wetlands in the rear. Um, and as I said, well, I'm hoping to get a, a negative determination from the commission uh, this evening. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions uh, the commission may have. Okay, so it appears there's no opportunity for any uh, stormwater to uh, to run to the rear heading towards the wetlands. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and, I, and I did fail to mention, um, because the site is so small and there is no stormwater management currently on site, uh, we've, um, we've entered into an agreement with the city um, to pay into the city's stormwater management mitigation fund um, because there's no room for stormwater on site. Uh, so I believe the the cost to do so is based on uh, the square footage of impervious coverage on site, and I believe it's in the range of thirty thousand dollars. I believe it is. So it's no uh, it's no small uh, it's no small ta small task, but yeah, you are correct. None, none of the stormwater uh, on site will be draining uh, towards our wetlands. Okay, and, and the roof does it have roof drains that go also towards the street? Yeah, the roof the roof drains actually drain towards the rear. Uh, and again, they're, they're not changing the roof line itself, um, so that'll that'll remain as is in, in today. And it would be considered clean runoff anyway. It's, it's not a metal roof; it's just a a, a standard, uh, you know, asphalt um, uh, roofing system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board? I just got a couple questions slash comments. So, um, to be clear, so the basically the sheet flow from the property is going to go to the city's uh, stormwater system. And the, the fee that you're paying, I presume, is contributing to the city's MS4 permit program in an effort to bring the city into compliance with overall stormwater management in the city. That is correct. I, I was working with the uh, with city staff um, and just, again, based on the size of the property, the existing utilities on the property, there's really no room to put anything anyway. Um, it would be very limited. Um, it's all fill, most likely on site anyway. So um, in lieu of that, yes, we decide to, uh, to pay into the fee. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I guess the only reason I bring that up is, you know, from an environmental benefit point of view, that fee will contribute to some stormwater reduction somewhere else in the city. Correct. It contributes to that fund. Right. Correct. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. At $30,000, it seems like you guys got off on a uh, pretty good deal. <laughs> My client wasn't too happy about the 30000 It's hard to pay it up front, but when you compare the, the, you know, the cost of construction of a system, if this was possible, and the maintenance and upkeep of a system like this um, seems 
totally reasonable. Yep. No, I, 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 I fully agree. Okay. If there's no more uh, comments from, uh, from the commission, is there anyone from the public that would like to comment? I know we don't need to take comments, but sometimes somebody tunes in. If not, uh, do we have a motion? Sure, I'll offer a motion to issue a negative three determination for this project. Uh, negative three, it won't, uh, won't affect the, uh, the resource. Uh, right. Second on that. I'll second. Seconded by Brad. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimously passed. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Tamola, for uh, explaining the project to us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commission members. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, we have a uh, another request for determination of applicability uh, uh, sent in by Daniel Dean, 125 Totman Street. Uh, it, this is a request to expand an existing driveway within the 100-foot buffer zone to bordering vegetative wetlands. I, I believe it was also a proposal to uh, to resurface this uh, driveway area. Uh, I see uh, somebody here from the uh, proponent. Uh, is, is this Daniel or Lillian Dean? It says Lillian. No, it's Daniel. Okay. <laughs> All right. Would you like to explain what you'd like to do out there? Yes, um, I have a stone driveway and the grass has been growing up through the stones and the city keeps fining me for parking on grass. I totally weeded the whole driveway this June and now we're into the fall and I'm not able to maintain the driveway as the city sees fit. My proposal is is to put down a barrier with some more stone over it or recycled asphalt to keep the grass from growing up and stop the city from fining me. Okay, this is uh, news to me that uh, that the city finds people for uh, parking on grass, especially if it's not lawn, particularly. Um, this has been an ongoing problem with the city for the last two years. Okay, I've had my driveway. This this driveway's been existing for twenty years. I've I've never had a problem before with the city. I have a problem with my one of my neighbors that keeps calling the city on me for every little thing, and it's nonstop. I wanted to take and weed out the the weeds out of my driveway and the city told me that I could not do this until I pulled a permit and <laughs> by pulling a permit I was suggested to redo the driveway and take care of this once and for all so I'm not being harassed by the city any longer okay um you know, the, uh, the issue I think really here as far as the uh, construction that you've proposed is the, is the uh, topography of, of your yard. It's a fairly steep drop from the street down to your back property line. And uh, just beyond the property line is the wetland that brought you to come before this board. Uh, we did have... Uh, comments from the city and we also have a stormwater team in the city that uh, sent comments and uh, the the issue would be if you if you disturbed the area if you disturbed the soil that's there and brought in new loose soil the issue would be uh, what would that do to the runoff and what would that do to the wetland if uh, if runoff uh, is changed and if materials on that slope are, are somehow uh, uh, eroded or allowed to re erode and uh, end up in the wetland. So 
uh, I believe those are the issues that we're we're dealing with. And and when you come in for determination, uh, what we're determining is uh, can, can you continue, uh, you know, without further uh, further investigation into uh, what might happen after your project is built, or do we need to have you come in with a more detailed plan? And that's the point we're at now. The stormwater team apparently feels that this is uh, an area that uh, could crit critically impact the wetland, especially if it's uh, asphalt tailings that are suggested as as the surface. Uh, so on that on that note, I, I spoke to uh, Mike Sudinsky from the Water Department today. And he did uh, give me more information to go on on how to preserve the area. And my proposal, nobody gave me any kind of information on what I needed to do with the, making a plan and writing a plan. So I understand the impact on the wetlands now more after speaking with Mike today and going forth I would like to withdraw the proposed plan that I have to do the back part of my yard and only go to the end of my existing building for now so I can take and use my driveway and get my vehicles off the road and get the city off my back and in the springtime I will propose a new plan to finish the rear part of my backyard and more detailed with drawings and explaining what where the runoff is going to go. Mike explained to me that I have to put a barrier in the back of the property where the water can go and subside into the land and then subside into the swamp. And I, I agree 100%. My aunt used to work for the parks department and welcome. And, you know, I wanna do everything right. And I want to just take care of the initial problem I'm having at this moment with the city parking on the lawn. Um, and am I right in thinking that uh, your construction timeline might uh, stretch out until spring anyway? This is not really the time of year to be doing that type of work, I think. Not not if I if I if I scale back my project and only go to the edge of my prop to my foundation of the existing building, I will be well away more than a hundred yards a hundred feet away from the wetlands. And I should be able to take care of my problem for now. And then in the springtime, I'll Re revise my plan and submit a new plan to take care of the rest of the existing driveway in the back of the house next to the wetlands. Okay, well, I appreciate having additional information. Uh, you know, that may be what we require after we've uh, discussed this a little more, uh, you know, determine that you do need additional information. We don't actually have that plan in front of us that you're proposing to to do a, a shortened driveway and uh, uh once again i'm i'm uh i'm skeptical as to whether you can do driveway work this time of year uh, of that type you know moving earth and, and things like that uh, i i would feel comfortable if you want to come in with a different proposal well, the, the whole thing to is to uh, discuss that at our next meeting, which would be four weeks from now. Or yes, Madam Chair, um, the whole thing is is I'm under the wire right now. the The weather's turning worse, and I'm not proposing to do any work in the back part of the, my lot near the wetlands at all. I'm willing to wait until springtime and submit a new plan to take care of that area next spring. 
right now I just want to focus on getting my vehicles off the off the roadway into my driveway and get the city to stop writing me citations for parking on my lawn. Louisa, if, if I understand, um, you know, what was just said um, by the applicant, it sounds like what he's proposing is to do work outside of the jurisdictional area of the Conservation Commission now, and then revise his plan that he has in front of us in the RDA to provide more detail of what will be covered within the jurisdictional area. Did I accurately capture that? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what I'm proposing at this time because I was not, not prepared for this. Sure. And, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything properly. I want to make sure, I don't want to impact the wetlands in any way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that to me seems reasonable. I guess, you know, the question I, I, I would have, Joe, maybe for you, it's my sense is he could just amend his current RDA. He doesn't have to do a new RDA submission because, you know, as of right now, we would, you know, encourage a continuation of this RDA because we need more information. What's the difference between continuing it and getting the additional information versus kind of, you know, uh, voting it down and having him incur a cost for submitting a new application? Yeah. So I, I have one concern. Um, I'm hesitant in believing that this is really more than 100 feet to the back corner of the, the foundation. I'm thinking like it, it looks like it's about 100 feet to the front corner, the front left corner of your foundation. So I, I would question that you are really outside of the jurisdictional area for this work. Um, it's critical that you, you know, confirm that you are a hundred feet away from these wetlands before you undertake any work. Um, that said, if it's outside of that hundred foot buffer, this is not part of our jurisdictional area. So, um, okay, how, how do I go about finding if I'm within the 100 feet of the wetlands? I mean, the, we, do, we do have a plot plan that you submitted that shows uh, 60 feet from your back property line to the back corner of your house. And that's where you're proposing to uh, extend uh, to, to stop work. Uh, with your amended proposal. Now, right after your property line, I believe is where the wetland begins, if not on your property. So that would be 60 feet. And what Brad's saying is uh, if you uh, cut it back another 40 feet, then you'd definitely be out of the 100 foot buffer. We're getting pretty close to the street at that point. So I, I don't know that you've got any work really that you can do that's outside of our jurisdictional area. I understand the desire, uh, you know, to, to keep it at the top of the hill, but I, the, the plan doesn't really outline what you're looking to do. You're trying to, ch you know, change it now. And this is something that needs to be reviewed further. So if you want to confirm exactly where that hundred foot buffer is, one way to go about doing that is to hire a wetland scientist who would flag uh, the, and delineate the edge of wetlands, which you could then measure from. He would do that by locating wetland plants and tying ribbons to them. Um, okay, so but can judging I- Judging by the map, I think, that I, I think that I can tell pretty closely that you, you're, you really don't have a lot of room to work outside of the 100 foot buffer. Okay, so then why don't we uh, continue this and I will write up a proposal and do another drawing where my runoff will be going. And, and so, so it's not going into the swamp area. I, I think that you have a lot of work to do on this project. I think that I would recommend that you uh, withdraw this RDA and file a notice of intent and NOI, which has um, a greater level of detail and, and explanation of what the work that you're trying to do. Brad, I mean, I'm one. Is, I think we can get the let that additional detail without the additional cost and transaction 
of, of an NOI, um, okay. you know, uh, to do an NOI, I mean, he's going to have to send notices to a butters and, and get their green cards, you know, receipt. It's just a lot. And that to me is generally for projects that we know are bigger in scope and, you know, potential impacts to the jurisdiction and you provide him the, the uh, formal opportunity for public comment. And I just think at this point, if we can get the additional detail, you know, I, I don't think we need to go that route at this point in time. If we, after reviewing it, we think that, you know what, the level of work, you know, is significant, then, you know, the next step would be the NOI, but I, I'd take a more iterative approach just as a suggestion. That's fair. Um, looking at the, the options that are possible here, it looks like there's, it's a, there's a lot of work to do. And I just want to make sure that um, you basically have the, the opportunity to spend money to decrease the time of this proposal, at which point there is still no guarantee of it passing through, you know, based on your presentation. Um, or, or taking probably what will be a longer approach by amending this RDA with some suggestions, uh, you know, kind of moving forward. We can, we can offer some suggestions now though, I, I would imagine that would start this process. Is that, do you agree, Louisa? Uh, I, yes, I think you need to understand the, if he understands the concerns of both the stormwater team and the conservation commission uh, we're concerned about uh, erosion. We're concerned about uh, a runoff that uh, and may not be clean water that could, uh, especially if it's parking of cars and trucks, uh, that could uh, damage uh, things in the wetland. And uh, you need to somehow slow down that uh, anytime you say improving a parking area, usually means smoothing it out and letting the water run quicker. You need to somehow slow down that, uh, that water so that, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't damage uh, the wetland when it arrives there. Uh, so there's different strategies for that. And that's what comes forth when you do do a notice of intent. They have uh, uh, different proposals that can uh, mitigate what's uh, going to perhaps damage the wetland. Uh, you know, I think the, the size of the, of the driveway, perhaps going all the way to the edge of your property is, doesn't leave any kind of a buffer strip there that also helps uh, mitigate both uh, pollution and erosion. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more detail that you can propose here. And I would advise, uh, you know, consulting with somebody, uh, I don't know if the city has has uh, anybody that can uh, help you with this or not. At this point, they're kind of short staffed. Uh, but I think uh, doing some more work is, is a good idea and uh, notice of intent are, are expensive. Uh, if you do a full blown one and uh, uh, perhaps, you know, just doing a little more work and and uh, being conscious of, of the issues um, might get you to a project that we could approve with a uh, determination of applicability instead of a notice of intent. Okay, um, I'll start working on that and um, I'll, I'll address again at the next meeting and mm -hmm. I'll get the paperwork in the Fran so okay. it's we are off for the holidays. So you have quite a long, long stretch here. Uh, January 13th is the next meeting. So somewhat after, uh, shortly after New Year's, you'd need to uh, get that material in if you want to be on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay, that's fine. So are we uh, then uh, continuing this? Or I think that's what we're intending. Would somebody like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll offer a motion to continue um, this uh, RDA uh, application to the January 13th meeting. Motion. I'll second Bill's motion. Made, seconded by Kevin. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, unanimous. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dean, and uh, we look forward to your new proposal.
Thank you very much, and you have a good holiday. You, you too. Well, you thank too. you. Thank you. Okay, we have a notice of intent coming up next. Uh, uh, Corey Schutman for Boston Gas of Waltham. The DEP number is 2060804. And this is a Lowell area gas modernization project. <coughs> so someone here for, uh, I see Corey, you're here. So. Uh, yes. yes, good evening. I'm Corey Schutzman, um, lead environmental scientist with um, Boston Gas. We have several members of our team today uh, here to support uh, any questions that may come up, but um, the project manager, Matthew Hayward, will begin the presentation uh, to introduce the project, and then Shona Pataseas, the environmental consultant, will uh, take us through the wetlands and resource area impacts. Take it away, Matt. Great. Thank you, Corey, and uh, thank you, uh, Lowell Conservation Commission and uh, Madam Chair, for uh, allowing us time during your meeting tonight. We've been working uh, with a few different departments of the Lowell, um, you know, for this project for the last couple of years, so I'm pretty pleased that we're, we're able to present this. Uh, Shona, are you able to share your screen with the presentation? Shona, are you still there? All oh, right. Well, yes, yes, sorry, I was, uh, was muted. Uh, yes, I, we do have a presentation, and if you would allow uh, me to share my screen, I can put it up. All right. I think we were given that ahead of time, but it was uh, very well done, so I don't mind looking at it again, and certainly there's people from the public here tuned in. Okay. Here we go. You see this one? Uh, not yet. So did you grant access? I believe I did. Yep. Uh, now, now we have it. There we are. Great, thanks, Jonah. So um, as Corey introduced me, uh, my name is Matt Hayward and I am the project manager for the Lowell Area Gas Modernization Project. Um, and as Corey mentioned uh, with us today, um, we do have Corey Schutzman and Shona Patasteas from the environmental team. Uh, I will be doing the introduction and then uh, Shona will be getting into some of the environmental impacts and in the, in the mitigation. Uh, next slide. Great, so I think in order to, uh, to start this off, I think it would be a good idea just to discuss what is the business case or the reason behind this project. Um, so, you know, as it says on screen here, the Lowell Area Gas Modernization Project is engineered to enhance the overall safety and reliability of the existing gas distribution network in the Lowell area through the use of new inspection technology. And basically what that means is we are looking to upgrade the Wilbur Lateral, as you see in that mapping below, um, to the appropriate uh, uniform dimension so we are able to perform inline inspection um, throughout the pipeline without impacting gas flow and without impacting customers and it will allow us to get more real-time feedback on the condition of that pipe out there. Uh, we'll get into, into a little bit more information on, on some of the uh, inline uh, inspection technology that we're looking um, to use for this project and the purpose for it. Um, but again, just to repeat, this is just gonna be a replacement of an existing line. Uh, you can see in that mapping below the, the purple area, uh, that will be the, um, the main line replacement we are looking to um, replace approximately two miles of existing gas main. Um, that existing gas main is a couple different diameters, everything from six inch and eight inch that are kind of scattered throughout that line. Um, and the purpose of this project is to uniform that, that, that portion of the lateral um, into a, a 12 inch diameter um, pipeline. Um, as you can also see on that map, this project is more than just the, uh, the main line replacement, uh, starting at the upper left-hand corner and kind of working our way down. You see that we also have a uh, Wilbur gate station where we are installing a pig receiver. Uh, as you follow that path down, again, that highlighted purple area is the um, replacement portion of the main line. Um, as you get into that kind of exploded boxed out area, that will be the horizontal directional drill. Uh, portion of it that is about 2,000 feet 
And again, it's just going to replacing the existing. I believe the existing we have in there right now is um, is existing six inch, and the new pipe will be twelve inch again, just to make sure we have that you know that uniform diameter throughout the rest of the of the lateral. Uh, as you continue down, you get to the brick kiln T replacement. Um, this is a, a national grid property that we're just replacing one fitting. We need to replace a, a T. Uh, as you follow that line more, you get to the uh, Whipple Road elbow replacement. And again, this is just going to be replacing um, just one fitting right there to, uh, to allow the inline inspection tool to move through it. Uh, and then you get down to the very end where that little square is. Um, and again, that's going to be on national grid property where we are installing a uh, pig launcher. Um, obviously the purpose of this meeting, we are just focused on the low impacts, as you can see, like I said before, with the um, with that kind of purple line, as well as that, um, that HDD crossing portion. Now, just a little bit more uh, background, we'll get into on the next slide. All right, so as I said before, um, you know, the purpose of this project really is for just updating uh, the, the pipeline we have existing. Um, so we are able to use inline inspection tool. Uh, the overall lateral or the overall pipeline is 5.8 miles. But again, we're only looking at replacing um, about two miles of that as the other 3.8 miles do have the appropriate sized 12 uh, inch pipe already installed. Um, so just a little bit more background exactly on what inline inspection is. Um, so it uses smart pigs, uh, smart pigs is, uh, well, pigs is an acronym for a pipeline inspection gauge. And you kind of see a little bit of a, that picture right there on your right. That is a, a larger tool than we'll be using on this pipeline, but it does give you a better idea of, you know, the, the, the type of, uh, technology that it is. Uh, those those uh, smart pigs are smart pipeline inspection gauges. Uh, they have a bunch of sensors and technology on them that allows them to, to move through the pipe without interrupting the gas flow and without interrupting the customers. Um, and as it moves through the line, it provides real-time feedback on um, you know, wall thickness, internal or external anomalies, um, you know, for example, like third-party damage. Um, along with that, this tool is also capable of cleaning the inside of the pipe uh, for both, um, you know, before and after the, the inspection. Um, again, you know, the purpose of this project is really just to standardize the, the pipe diameter of that, that two mile portion. Um, and I mentioned a couple of the fittings that we need to install. And again, that's just to make sure that the tool can move smoothly through the pipeline without, without getting stuck. Um, and again, you'll, you'll see on the, on the map, I just showed you that the majority of this project is through, um, existing right of ways. Um, in order to you know, limit disturbances and impacts to the abutters and businesses and the roadway as well. Um, one thing I do want to make mention of is that currently we are, you know, we are inspecting our pipeline, um, but the current means of doing that is through uh, above grade excavations um, at, at intermittent um, locations throughout the pipeline. And it doesn't really give us the, the full amount of information about that, that full pipeline that we'll be able to achieve um, you know, through these inline inspections and through this modernization of the pipeline. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just looking at, you know, kind of where we are uh, timeline wise, what we've gone through a couple of the, uh, the major permits that we've achieved so far. So we did receive the energy facility setting board back in uh, fall of 2019. Um, we received the, the permit and approval from mass DOT just, uh, just last month. Uh, we've also, held uh, the Conservation Commission meetings for both Chelmsford and Tewksbury. I believe that was back in August and in July, and those were approved as well. Um, and you can also see a couple upcoming permits that we'll be, uh, that we'll be working with or working on as well. They both been submitted, and that's the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, uh, the Section 404, um, as well as the 401 uh, water quality through uh, Mass DEP. And with that being said, I'm gonna hand this over to Shona Patisteus, who will talk about the environmental impacts and mitigation. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, so I'm gonna speak first through uh, the construction means and methods, through some of the, uh, the diagrams and detail sheets that were um, produced with the notice of intent. And then I'll go into the resource area mapping to show just where those uh, construction methods can be applied. Uh, so um, first, the Construction of a pipeline is, it works a little bit like an assembly line where you've got a number of different kind of phases going on uh, at, a, at the same time. So you have um, the initial laying down of the, the matting and establishing the work area. Um, 
you have to bring in all the equipment and, and materials you have to weld the pipeline together. Uh, you have to then uh, assemble the pipeline and put it into the trench and then come behind and, and close up at the same time. Um, at any given time along the entire route, all of these operations can be happening at the same time. And you'd have a lot of, you know, a number of different trucks, vehicles, uh, people, equipment passing each other at the same time. Uh, this is this diagram illustrates this where you have, um, these are uh, boom trucks, which kind of lift and hopscotch along the, the line and, and drop the, the pipeline into the, uh, into the trench. So, you know, and quite a bit of equipment on working at the same time. Uh, to facilitate all of this, especially in wetlands, uh, you've got this uh, work area where you've got a, 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 a soil, soil stockpile area on one side, the excavation trench kind of in the middle, and then uh, this working area where you've got all the, the trucks, equipment, people, uh, manufactured materials on the other side. Um, we're looking for about a 75-foot right-of-way um, in, in wetlands. The soils are on the one side, you, you strip the topsoil layer and you segregate that from all of the subsoils so that when you go to restore a little bit later, you can then put the subsoils in first and the topsoils in the top. Um, and what, we'll do this to the extent possible in wetlands, um, especially in some of the kind of the marshier wetlands, this might not be uh, possible to segregate topsoils. In that case, on the soil side, you just have kind of a, you know, a container, um, a built um, kind of, um, a corralled area so that you can contain all the, the wet soils on the one side. Uh, this, the soil side is, is 30 feet, the uh, trench is approximately five feet, and then it's about 40 feet to allow um, all that uh, the vehicles and equipment. We'll say as well, we have limited points of access to the right of way in some locations along the line. Uh, so the 40 feet will also accommodate an emergency lane uh, in, in the event that there, we need to get some vehicles out in, in a hurry. Uh, the, addition, the existing right-of-way is about 20 feet, so you, we will be working outside of the existing right-of-way to get to that 75 feet. Um, in some cases, uh, there will be some tree clearing to accomplish that level flat space where we can get out and do the work. Uh, most of this will be on, on mats within wetlands. All of this will be on mats in wetlands, except for the trench itself. So we were proposing uh, where we are not directly where the excavation trench is, the trees will be cut at grade uh, so that you can both lay the matting down. There's less disturbance to the actual soils because we're not pulling out the, uh, the stumps unless you have to because we're in the middle of the excavation trench. Um, and this will later on uh, promote regrowth, regeneration of a number of the trees that we will be clearing directly from the root and uh, a stump sock. There are two stream crossings along the line. The first is uh, Black Brook, which is uh, at the end of Old Canal Drive to the south of the uh, Mount Pleasant Golf Course. The second is the River Meadow Brook, which is in the um, kind of the parking area. Uh, between um, the Cross Point Towers and the uh, uh, Cinema Deluxe off of 32 Reese Ave. Uh, this first one is Black Brook, and I know it's a little bit difficult to see the plans, uh, but when you construct in a stream, you have to stop the flow of water uh, so that you can get in to um, put the pipeline across it. The way you do this is you set up two um, coffer dams uh, to uh, upstream and downstream. You have a, a pump set up uh, in the upstream side and it pumps around to the downstream side. The pump is never set on the bottom of the stream. It comes up a little bit. There's a kind of a cage around it so you don't entrap and train anything in the stream and you're not pulling in sediment. On the downstream stream side as well, you don't just directly um, let the, you know, the water flow. Uh, you have usually some devices, um, a geotextile fabric or other to, you know, to attenuate the flow and to not scour out the downstream side of the stream. Uh, the, the setup and the, and the actual working within the stream bed and then um, decommissioning of, the, of this setup is start to finish about two weeks. So it's not an awful lot of time uh, working in stream. And then at the River Meadow Brook, it's pretty much the same thing. We've got the coffer dams, uh, River Meadow Brook, because you do have some um, paved parking areas on either side. We have a little bit less of a, um, we don't have the 75 foot uh, work zone on, on both sides, it's a 55 foot, or sorry, a 50 foot work zone on both sides. 
So working into the, uh, the resource area mapping, uh, this is the Wilbur Gas Regulator Station. Uh, this is Old Canal Drive uh, and the Mount Pleasant uh, Golf Course. Black Brook is the first stream crossing and pretty much the first area where we get into uh, some of the wetlands crossings. Uh, we, this is one of the areas where I was saying that we don't have an awful lot of access points. We can come directly from the uh, regulator station and along the right of way. We also have an access route between the two buildings here at the end of uh, Old Canal Drive. Uh, from there, we get into um, second sheet here the crossing of the Middlesex Canal. Um, we do actually have a crossing plan for this one as well. Uh, we do. We won't be going. We'll be setting up matting to one side and the other of the where the approximate canal location is. Uh, this crossing is actually regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, the Massachusetts Historical Commission is also involved in the, the, the permitting and regulating of um, how we, we work in this area. The, the Middlesex Canal is a uh, nationally registered uh, historical landmark. So we were working with um, an archeologist uh, who will be on site uh, during all work in this, this area. Um, in this area, you have a deviation from the existing path of the pipeline. Uh, and this is to accommodate some requests by uh, New England Power Company so that we're not working uh, across their right of way. We're crossing it to um, at a perpendicular angle. So this is this is what explains kind of this, this deviation. Um, it's important to note too that where we have this cleared right of way uh, within the wetlands uh, along the existing route, uh, that will be released. The easement will be released. Um, all maintenance in this area will be released once the new uh, pipeline is constructed. Uh, on the next page, we start to get into, this is the, uh, the Lowell Highlands area, uh, kind of the second section where we have very limited access. Uh, we're only looking to come off of uh, Chatham Street and we will not be coming off of Chelmsford Street. It's a very busy road to be you know, having a lot of uh, construction equipment come in from Chelmsford, uh, sorry, from Chelmsford Street. So we'll have kind of this uh, two-way traffic, or sorry, one-way traffic coming up and down from Ch uh, Chatham Street. On the right side of the page, you've got the River Meadow Brook Crossing. Uh, this one is narrow. It's a channelized stream, uh, and we'd be working from, from each side of this. This is where you'd have the copper dam set up with the uh, pump around of the stream um, the second time. The uh, last area in Lowell is in and around this commercial area, the uh, cinema um, off of 32 Reese Ave. Uh, very little, we were able to avoid impacts to uh, wetlands in this area. We have one crossing where it appears some storm water, maybe from all this, this parking area, uh, discharges into a wetland over here. And we, we kind of cross right where the, the, um, the culvert, the stormwater culvert discharges into that wetland. And then at the very end is the um, horizontal directional drill uh, setup area. So the horizontal directional drill will uh, cross all of the, the highways, connectors, and access roads when you go from Lowell in toward Chelmsford. So uh, mitigation for the project is primarily going to be um, restoration of disturbed surfaces through in situ restoration. And now what this involves is uh, we'll have mats down, which uh, it's a it's a best management practice so that you don't have heavy equipment operating in wetlands. They're not running up the wetlands. Uh, so at the end of the project, we'd pull all the wetlands and working off of kind of that leading edge, um, as you're pulling the, the matting up, you restore any soil surfaces where you might have a little bit of compaction or uh, rutting from the, the actual uh, matting itself. Uh, this can be done by kind of small machinery or hand raking. Um, you pull up the, the, the matting, uh, we, we, where the excavation trench is, we'll put down um, some seed, but for any of the areas under the swamp matting within that larger 75 foot area, we'd be looking at the, um, the existing kind of root and um, seed stock to, to reestablish um, a vegetation in those areas. Um, the last step is to put down some, um, depending on the time of year, we put down um, mulch, both to kind of stabilize any disturbed soils, but also to promote growth of, of vegetation to keep uh, you know, moisture in the soil. Uh, National Grid has internal programs. We're also bound by, you know, a number of different environmental conditions to um, monitor restoration um, and to um, take any, you know, 
corrective actions in the case that you know the the, the uh, herbaceous vegetation is not reestablishing. So we'd be monitoring that until we got um, successful regrowth of vegetation across the project. The second mode of mitigation that we're looking for is a monitored reforestation. And this is for the areas uh, within that larger 75 foot uh, work area where uh, we're, we'd be monitoring for the regrowth of, of trees. Uh, kind of our understanding is that, um, or our belief is that natural succession is the, is the most successful way that you're gonna get the reestablishment of forest in this area. Uh, the, you know, the biggest, the highest uh, species composition you have in this area is red maple, there's red oak. You also have some um, American elm and gray birch. Red maple especially is incredibly uh, prolific. It, you know, they, it sprouts very, very well from uh, root and stump stock. So if we were are able to cut and leave the stumps in for uh, that kind of that outer 75 feet, then we'll be able to, it'll, we'll watch the, for the growth of that. Um, there's some, mon there's some measures. It's, it's a measured growth. It's, we would uh, set up a kind of a plot sampling um, throughout the, those five years. Uh, and we also have some provisions for invasive species management. Um, we talked with uh, Mass DOT in particular about uh, the methods for invasive species management. Uh, they were concerned at one point that uh, we might have some invasive species that will um, uh, potentially prevent the, the regrowth of trees. So we've, we've worked with them to have a, an invasive species program within that uh, mitigation plan. Uh, one of the other um, studies that we, we did in support of the notice of intent was a wildlife habitat evaluation, which looked at the effects of uh, the kind of the temporary tree clearing on um, habitat. And what we found is that you don't have an overall loss of habitat features, you, you just have a change in general. Instead of having you know, um, uh, uh, hard mass or acorns from some of the trees, you'd have some, uh, you'd have food that's replaced by understory growth by uh, herbaceous vegetation. Uh, but to mitigate for some of the loss of the habitat features that would come from the loss of the trees, uh, Nash, Boston Gas Company would look at um, creating some snag trees to replace uh, you know, woodpecker and small animal habitat and uh, some brush piles on the right of way to replicate some of the, kind of the underbrush habitat that's, that's better for small mammals. Uh, the, very, the last form of mitigation that we have for the project is the in lieu fee program uh, through our section 404 um, filing with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we need to pay into uh, their in lieu fee uh, program for mitigation generally for the project. Uh, so at this point, I think, you know, we have a, a pretty substantial team here to ans answer any questions that the commission may have and that the, the public may, may have as well. Thank you. Uh, we do have some people from the public. Let me go to the commission first, though. Is there anyone from the commission that would like to comment? Yeah, Louise, I have a few uh, comments. Okay, Bill. Um, thank you. Um, let me just, I'm using my screen. Wrong, but uh, I guess I'd like to start first by saying thanks for a very thorough presentation. I, I think uh, it gave some good insight as to the process you know, by which National Grid approached this project and how you arrived to your preferred alternative. Um, I'm glad to see that mitigation and restoration seems to be at an appropriate level, especially considering the temporary uh, impacts to the wetland, and that they'll be monitoring to ensure that um, there will be recovery after the project is completed. Um, and I also like the uh, the in lieu fee, you know, on Section 404. Um, obviously, uh, you know, to find that those types of projects can provide mitigation in other areas as well. So that's great. I did have a couple of quick questions. I'm, I'm just curious, first of all, with regard to the permitting, you know, where are you with respect to the National Historic Preservation Act? It sounds like you're gonna, you follow the process of avoid, minimize and mitigate, and you're gonna have an archeologist out there and, you know, observe the work. So are you expecting that permit and that won't slow down your process? Sure, I can, I can take that question. The, um, we have submitted our uh, section 404 permit to uh, the, the core. Uh, the core is the lead federal agency in, in terms of um, 
administering the National Historic Preservation Act permitting. So we are currently working with the Corps um, and working with uh, our archaeologists and Mass Historic to come to an agreement. We would anticipate that the um, the Corps should be at, uh, issuing that permit sometime in the next few months. I know we, we will be actively working through Mass Historic even after that permit is issued uh, to follow up on the conditions of the permit. And then the second question I have is my, my sense is, you know, there's a business case for this and that business case is to improve the safety of gas delivery. And I would argue also, um, you know, to increase the efficiency of gas delivery. I, I, I wonder if you could kind of opine on that for just a quick, you know, second or two to give members of the public and then some better sense as to the rationale as to why this project is needed. Sure, and I think I can take that on. Um, you know, part of it is also federal regulations in terms of uh, requiring these types of inspections every nine years. Um, so I think, you know, from the point of the public, uh, we, we need to do these inspections regardless. Um, and without this modernization project, um, you know, we, are, we have to resort to that, that really impactful having to dig, you know, um, test pits or, or trenches over the existing line. Um, you know, uh, acquiring more permits, potentially needing uh, temporary workspace from abutters. So, you know, I, I think there's also that fact of cost and also the impact to the public, which also kind of pushes the reason for this modernization even more. Um, and then I know a lot of the other questions we get that we've seen, you know, throughout this uh, this permit permitting process is, you know, why are we why are we deciding to upgrade the, the diameter to that 12 inch? Um, you know, as I said before, we have a few sections of six, a few sections of eight. Um, you know, why aren't we, you know, minimizing some of the existing pipe down to that six or that eight inch? Um, and it really just comes down to where the technology stands. Um, there, there are inline inspection tools that can fit inside of the six inch and eight inch. However, um, because of that smaller diameter, it, it kind of elongates that tool and makes it that much more difficult for it to get around corners and bends and through T's. So, Yes, it is an upsize in a few sections of the pipe, but it's really just because the quality of the tool that we can get from a 12 inch diameter inline inspection tool is, is that much more valuable, that much more reliable, and just that much easier to use when we're actually doing the inline inspections. Right. And okay, I also apologize, it's not every nine years, it's every seven years. And related to that, and thank you for that, just kind of my final question is, um, I'm curious, I'm sure you're aware of, you know, what happened with Con Edison in this part of the, the state with the explosions back in 27, 2018, I think it was. I'm curious, does any of this requirement, um, you need any sort of permanent or uh, approval from the Pipeline and Hazardous Safety Administration within USDOT, or is that kind of embedded in the overall approval process? Sure, do you know the answer on that one? I know we don't need the approval from them. I can tell you that much. I'm just not sure if it's embedded in one of the other permits. Matt, this is Jeff O'Donnell. Can I attempt to answer this? Yeah, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioner. My name is Jeff O'Donnell. I'm an engineer with CHA Consulting, working with National Grid on this project. Um, because this project is not an in trust interstate pipeline, it does not meet the requirements of an energy facility uh, of a federal energy regulatory commission uh, filing. It is uh, at the level of the energy facility siting board, uh, which the the, the uh, team has gone and gotcha. received those approvals. All right. No, thank you for that. And um, I, I just asked more for curiosity because I, I think it's great when you look at new technologies. And I was just curious if you know, the incident that happened, you know, with Con Edison and, and then having FISPA, you know, you know, come up with uh, inspections, were there any lessons learned from that that kind of led to this technology or has it been kind of a technology that's already been you know, in the kind of the, the, the public domain for a number of years? Um, I'm sorry, do you mean the uh, the Columbia gas um, explosions that happened in the Yeah, Manhattan I'm sorry, Valley? the Columbia, I'm okay. sorry about that. Yeah, Columbia. Is Matt, um, you want to so try to answer that one as well or? I can handle that. I think I got this one. Um, so I think the first thing I really want to make sure that we distinguish is that that incident that happened in in, um, in the Merrimack Valley gas um, explosions that happened a couple of years ago, that was on a distribution line. 
this line is going to be transmission only. So this line does not feed into any of the, you know, the, the houses and the customers and the abutters and the, uh, you know, the residents of the city of Lowell. So that's one thing. Um, but as far as lessons learned from that, from that incident, I think there's a couple and please, Jeff, if I, if I leave some out, please, you know, let me know. But I think, um, you know, I think the big thing is just having the records of your pipeline. Um, you know, that's one of the things that National Grid is really working hard to make sure we have those historically accurate records to make sure we know exactly, you know, where the feed lines are or, you know, where this line is being served from. And I think that was one of the big, um, the big lessons learned from that, that Columbia Gas just, they just didn't have the records. Um, the other big thing too, is that I, I believe Columbia Gas did not have a standard operating procedure when it came to doing these, um, you know, these difficult tie-ins into either an existing or, or a new gas main. Um, and that's another thing that, that National Grid has really stepped up and done. I know we have a multi-level uh, of review on any type of standard operating procedure for any type of live gas work. Um, so I, I think that's that's another big takeaway too, is that you know just that initial planning, it, it's it's gonna make the difference in the end. And, and I think that's kind of one of the faults that was seen out of that, that Merrimack Valley situation. Um, and as far as technology goes, you know, that's kind of why I started off by saying there is a difference between distribution and transmission. Um, this, this inline inspection really did not spur from that incident, um, just because like I said, it is distribution, but, you know, going back years and years and years, you know, another, another incident too, would be the San Bruno out in California. Um, and that was kind of the driving factor for a lot of these new transmission uh, requirements that we're seeing, especially this one with the inline inspection. Um, so I'd say that there'd be more lessons learned from that incident. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's lessons learned in, in every incident. No, thank you for that. And again, I think you guys did a great uh, presentation today. Um, I just uh, had a couple questions related to that. And I guess the final thing I would just say as a comment, not only does it make pipeline safety better, but you're right. I think part of the intent of these in inline inspections to reduce any sort of leakages of gas because as we know gas you know methane ga gas leaks have you know 10 to 20 times the amount of you know uh, climate change you know greenhouse gas effects than carbon dioxide so i think that's great anything you can do to minimize those releases of methane to the environment and, and i agree with that you know i'll take this opportunity to say that you know for this pipeline the wilbur lateral we haven't had any leaks in its history which is really good and i think that you know the modernization and, and using this technology as you just mentioned is only going to make sure that we continue that that positive streak well thanks again uh, i'm done louise if someone else on the commission has any questions thank you okay. uh if i could just ask a question uh you you use a different method going under you know, the highways and, and various uh, areas of uh, subsurface drilling of some sort. Uh, is that not a method that you could use for the whole pipeline? Um, so we actually did look into that as an alternative. Um, but, and, and Jeff, I believe that you were kind of involved with some of this when we were looking at some of the preliminary um, alternatives for the main line. Um, but it really comes down to um, you know, soil stability, ledge, um, you know, setup location, making sure that we have the area that we need on either side of that, that directional drill. So, you know, it was an option that we did look at, but just because of the conditions, you know, the conditions going underneath that highway are very different than the conditions that are, are going through that wetlands. And so it's not really an apples to apple comparison just because, you know, the space, um, you know, restrictions, like I said, you know, the, the bedrock and the ledge, um, the types of soils, how loose they are, how compacted they are, uh, those really kind of all go into play in the success of horizontal directional drill. And that was kind of why the team stayed away from that is because, you know, we're trying to protect the, uh, the wetlands and, you know, and if the soil conditions aren't correct, um, it's, it's, it's a high risk of it failing. So that's why we decided to go for the, uh, the open cut. Thank you. Uh, Shauna, would you mind if we took down your, uh, your, uh, video here now, because, uh, I can't see who else is in, in attendance here. Yep. No problem. Okay. Is there anyone else from the commission that has comments or questions? Uh, I have a few questions. So um, first, what's the estimated lifespan of the pipeline? I'm sorry, do you mean, you know, once it's installed, how long do we expect it to last for? Yes. All right. Um, let me just ask my team that question because I think we have the correct person on. 
While we're at it, I'd be curious to hear of the lifeline, uh, lifetime expectation of the existing line as well. All right, I apologize. They're uh, they're typing on to me right now. <laughs> we got a, we got an engineer on who's who's working on this. Great. So that was just to make sure I'm clear. That was the expected life, uh, the expectancy of the new pipe as well as existing. Um, and if if it might take a little bit of time to get that answer, um, my next question is a part of the uh, reforestation mitigation plan. So. Um, you have planned to monitor for 10 years after, is that correct? I, I believe it was, um, it was five years um, and we would look at the uh, you know, success rate after five years. Um, proposed corrective actions is needed um, if after five years, you know, we're, we're hitting uh, successful growth, then um, we'd look to, you know, we'd look to reduce the inspection frequency. And that's just to make sure that um, the certain trees uh, have grown to a satisfactory rate? Yeah, so there's um, different different species grow at different rates. Um, you know, as, as part of natural succession as well, you have um, a number of kind of pioneer trees established first. So we, we would expect to see within the first couple of years, especially with the red maples, um, you know, some pretty prolific growth. Uh, it would it would look kind of shrubby uh, at first. You'd have a number of different uh, small saplings arise, but then after a few years, uh, when you start to have shading between different trees and competition between the different species, you would have a little bit of a die off of some of the other. So th you know, those are sort of markers that we we would be looking for over that that first five years. Um, you know, something that would be kind of a red flag or, or where you would need corrective action is if you don't see uh, the right growth rates. So a red maple is two to three, uh, is on average about two to three feet a year you'll get. Um, sometimes you, you'll see as, as much as six feet in the first couple of years. So if we're not seeing uh, the growth of, of the species that are prolific now with, within that, those areas, uh, you know, we, we would we would recommend some corrective actions if we are seeing everything you know on target where it needs to be um, as compared to uh, you know some of the data that we'd referenced in that reforestation plan. Uh, we, we'd like to call that successful and and either reduce the the uh, inspection frequency or or stop going out for um, inspections altogether. And just to add to to Shona's point, this is Corey. Um, we'd also be monitoring for invasive species. Um, to come in and try and keep up with removing that at the same time so we can allow the natural um, species to really have a good chance to, to revegetate. Re and that's very important within that first five years. There are a number of invasive species in that area already. Um, you know, I, I think it's unrealistic to think that we'd completely eliminate invasive species, you know, from a, from a small section of the, the, you know, the area that's kind of part of a larger habitat. Um, you know, I know, especially in the kind of the larger uh, wetlands, there's um, there's Phragmites, there's purple loosestrife within the the wooded sections. There's an awful lot of uh, buckthorn and um, you know some some other species that uh, will treat to encourage the you know the regrowth of the trees. Uh, but we're we're not going to completely eliminate, especially from a smaller area of a you know, kind of a larger forest. Uh, that, that brings up my next question about invasive species. Uh, I've been through the area quite a bit, and um, uh, I noticed that in your report, you didn't mention uh, bittersweet or knotweed, and there's loads of both of yeah. those. Uh, so I just want to make sure those would be included. Yeah, the, the, um, the, the knotweed is typically an upland species i think it you know it encroaches on kind of the um the wetland edges uh you know most of the areas where we're talking about uh, 
uh, the significant amounts of tree clearing is is where you you don't have as much of a growth of the knotweed, but that's certainly something um, grow, grows very fast and <laughs> would outcompete you know some of the the trees that we're looking to establish. So yes, that is one of the ones that um, if it's in those areas, we'd we'd be treating. Sim similarly with uh, um, with bittersweet. Um, now, so say after that five years, um, you guys come back and um, you're satisfactory, the, the trees are growing fine. What, um, what will you revert to then as far as um, your management for the, um, the growth of the land uh, just in general? So within the pipeline corridor itself, um, we'll we'll have about 30 feet on on for the for the corridor. Uh, for the directly over the pipeline, we can only have um, per federal standards, state standards, you can only have herbaceous vegetation. You don't want a lot of roots growing over a pipeline. Um, on the kind of the outer edges, so you at, at 30 feet, the outer two five edges, or sorry, two. Um, Five feet on either side for you know, a total of 10, we'd allow uh, shrub growth, but you can't have um, trees in that area either. So perpetual uh, mowing through the, through the center, allowing the growth of um, shrubs on the sides with uh, selective uh, removal of, of trees and then you know the, the rest of it would be uh, we, we don't we don't have the rights to that land after the project is done. you know that 75 feet is is uh, is not easement that's owned by Boston Gas Company. We only have that as temporary workspace. So that's not something that you know we, we'd be going through again. And that, that's multiple uh, different owners throughout the whole line? That's correct, yeah. OK, uh, those are all my questions. I had a question. <clears throat> Weston? Weston Standish. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Um, very informative. Um, definitely all for safety and less gas leaks. I was just wanted to. I was just wondering why the right of way through the wetland crossing is required to be 75 feet, whereas the one through the upland crossing is 50. I mean, you know, I think we'd rather have a smaller crossing through the wetland. But uh, you know, to explain that would be great. Sure. The the 50 feet in an upland area assumes that um, some of the the extra uh, space that you would need for uh, emergency vehicles passing, uh, you, you know, you don't need to be in that that 50 feet. You can you can access. You don't account. You incorporate extra room for um, for, for for public safety. Um, also, when you're working in um, unconsolidated soils, like as you get out toward the middle of the, you know, that larger marsh around the Middlesex Canal, it's, um, you need an awful lot of space in order to safely put down the matting and operate heavy machinery, especially when there's several vehicles working in tandem. Um, the 75 seat is... When you're stockpiling upland soils as well, you, you don't need that, that 30 foot um, soil stockpile area because soils in upland areas, they're, they're not saturated. They're, they're a little bit more cohesive, so you can stockpile them a lot more easily in a smaller space. When you're getting into very wet, marshy soils, you know, they, they don't pile as, as well. Um, and so you need a much larger area to be able to contain the soils that, um, that you're pulling out in order to, to, to put in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you will be using silt tent to uh, silt tents and everything to keep that all contained. I'm sure. Yep the um, the the diagram that I had showed earlier in the, the presentation there was um, right. yeah, some kind that. of two little darker lines. So there's silt fence on the outside of the soil stock, um, stockpile area uh, between the edge of the mat and you know the the edge of the wetland, and then there would be a second one where it's feasible to to separate kind of that topsoil right. and the subsoils. Yep. What about um. Uh, Precautions against turbidity when crossing the streams and things. So for crossing the streams, um, you do have the uh, the coffer dams on the upstream and the downstream side. So when you don't have the water flowing through the work mm -hmm. area, um, you know the there's there's not the turbidity from the disturbed so soils in the work area. Uh, to uh, stop turbidity as you're you're kind of pulling in the water and 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 moving it around to the other side of the uh, coffer dams. 
that you do have measures like you, you don't put the you know the pump on the bottom of the stream so you're sucking up the sediment um, on the other side when where the water is um, being discharged from the the hoses you, you have a kind of a an attenuation device or, or um, some sort of pad so that the water that's coming out of there is, is hitting in the pad instead of eroding the stream bank itself. Mm. Um, the pipes are sized appropriately as well. So, you, you know, you're not trying to put too much water through too small a pipe or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't have enough so that the, you know, the water is backing up behind your, your coffer dams. And that's part of that kind of those, those beginning calculations. And depending on the time of the year, the flow of storms, you need to be able to size your, your pipes appropriately. So that's part of the setup um, early on. And when do you expect to do this work? What time of year, if approved? Winter, um, winter spring, fall, when there's less water or more? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, there's, there's a couple of different restrictions. Uh, some, sometimes when working in waterways, you, you do have to look at time of year restrictions for working in the waterways. Um, you know, obviously for like a, a flow of water, um, spring is not the ideal time to be working in, in, in any of these streams, you know, sometimes in the, in the summer. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's a number of different um, influences on the schedule. And, you know, Matt, please feel free to, to jump in if I'm, you know, speaking incorrectly about the schedule. But I think there's, there's a couple of different concurrent um, pressures on the, on the schedule. Right. Uh, and I understand that just might be something to keep in mind as yes. working in wetlands. This past summer, you probably could have gotten away with uh, a lot less erosion considering we didn't have much rain. Um, yep. I had one more question. I forget uh, though what it might be. So if someone else has a question, you know, yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, do you mind if I actually hop back in here? I, I don't want to leave. Uh, I think it was uh, oh, Kevin actually, Dillon. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you can finish that thought. I, I remembered my question. I'll, I'll keep it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just wanted to get back uh, to, I think it was Kevin, and I believe it was Brian who had the yeah. question about the uh, the life expectancy of the pipe. Um, so we really, you know, took this long to give you this answer, but we really don't have a, a specific number for you. I can say this, that when we design these pipes, it's it's designed around integrity and demand. Um, and the reason why we really don't design for a lifetime is it really is dependent on the demand required on that pipe, um, as well as how well that, that, that pipe is protected. So if, if a line is properly protected from corrosion and third party damage, that pipe could last indefinitely. Um, you know, even for this pipe that's going through the wetlands, um, you know, it, it is coated, it is uh, cathodically protected. Um, and so again, you know, as long as we maintain that protection on it, this pipe is, it's going to last for, you know, I, I believe some, of, some of this line is over 50 years old. Um, and we, and we aren't replacing that piece because of the integrity is still good to this date. Um, so I know that doesn't really answer your question in terms of giving you a, a hard number in terms of life expectancy. Um, but I think that's kind of why, you know, all the more reason for this project is, if we can get in there and modernize this pipe and allow us to do this inline inspection, it's going to allow us to have that much more information, stay that much more ahead of any repairs or any uh, upgrades to it that, you know, we're not going to have to come back to you know, the Lowell Conservation Commission in, in three years saying, hey, we got to replace this because now we're going to have that information that we're going to be able to stay ahead of it and, you know, increase the life expectancy of this pipeline. Thank you. Is uh, anyone else from the commission uh, have something at the moment? Or we oh, I did remember my, Yeah, I was just, uh, w I uh, picked up on, you said you might put some mulch down. Do you know how much fill that might result in in the wetlands? Mulch? You know, it might be, mm -hmm. you know, variable due to the soil conditions, yeah. but any <laughs> idea? I mean. Mulch, not necessarily the um, like it's it's not uh, garden mulch. Uh, mulch in in typically we use a straw mulch. So if you have hay bales or straw bales on a project, you you rip up the straw bales and and you put mulch over the top. It's it's not um you know it's not a thick coating. It's uh, just enough to stop the uh, the soil surface from from eroding in 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 storms. You know this this area is fairly level, so I don't believe that's as much a concern as uh, anything with, you know, significant topo topography. Uh, but yeah, typically it's, it's straw. Okay, great. Yeah, no, that's what I was thinking. So. so you have been talking about how this pipe has had no leaks in the past. Um, I'm unsure whether or not repairs have had been made over the course of its life. 
that were preemptive and kept leaks from occurring? Sorry, just coming off mute there. Um, let me ask my team on that question again. Yeah, you're asking some of the historical stuff on this. That's, yeah, so let me. Uh, yeah, so I guess let me, let me kind team. of lead into it a little further then. Um, yep. If we have a pipe here that's not been repaired and doesn't require hasn't required maintenance yet, we're upgrading it in order to prevent future incident. Um, the you know the size is being increased by by four times the volume. Um, it it seems like the 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 money could be spent better to prevent leaks in other parts of the pipe. Um, so, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Uh, so no, I understand what you're saying. You know, it's you know you have that history of of no issues. You know, while you're fixing what isn't broken, um, and I think it's kind of a mixed bag because um, obviously you know as 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 this pipe goes on longer and longer and longer, there is that higher risk of there could be potentially you know a leak or some other type of repair. Um, so I think it just it's. I guess we're looking at it from a proactive point of view right now. I understand that yes, this money could be spent in other areas. Um, you know, I know that the distribution system, you know, it has its own issues to it. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of meeting that federal regulation, as well as just making sure we're staying proactive, um, you know, that that's going to be the point that we'll, we'll know when that repair is needed, as opposed to, you know, like we're saying now, when we have to go out and do these inspections without that inline inspection tool, we're just kind of potholing over the pipe and only being able to read so much information on it. So, Which federal guess, regulations in particular are you complying with by replacing this pipe? So it's not necessarily the replacement of the pipe that is the regulation. It is the inline inspection. Any any new pipes of this volume need to have inline inspection? Transmission in general. Okay. Um, I'm yeah. I'm 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 really hung up on the fact that we are replacing a pipe which hasn't seen any signs of deterioration are are some of your 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 test pits these digs that you've done in the past showing that we are reaching the end of critical life in some areas no no i'm uh still waiting on my uh co-worker brian to give me a little more background on this but no no and that's you know like i said it's if i can get you some more information oh here we go so no we haven't to be honest no we have not seen anything from our past excavations that are making us worry to the point that we would like to replace it. It's again, just kind of being proactive. So you're also being proactive with increasing gas demand in the city. What do you mean? What, is the, pro what, what is the true proactivity that we're searching for here? If it's not any risk of the pipe li life, it life itself, then we're, we're, I would say that it is being proactive with safety. I mean, just because we haven't had incidents in the past does not mean that we shouldn't protect ourselves from the future, I guess is the best way to kind of to summarize that. But you, you know, haven't seen uh, any evidence of upcoming issues. No, we haven't, but I, I think I would present it this way. Um, you know, just because we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it's not coming, um, especially because as I mentioned that this full pipeline is 5.8 miles. We're only replacing a portion of it you know, the other pipe that we're not replacing, we want to make sure that we're staying on top of that and making sure that that's still maintaining its integrity, as well as this new pipe that we're installing. So it's really just being proactive for public safety. You know, I understand what you're saying, where we don't have that history of issues with the pipeline. But I think it's, you know, if, if we become complacent, and you know, just because we haven't had any issues in the past doesn't mean we won't in the future, I think that's really where we're going to run into that, that situation where we will have those issues. There's a high output of environmental risk in comparison to the future protection. So that's what I'm trying to weigh is what is more damaging, um, a, a threat that we have no evidence of actually seeing any sign of upcoming versus the, the direct cause impact of the environment of doing this work, right? And, and not to, to, to pass judgment either way, but this is the, tr the question I'm really trying to get the to the bottom of. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that again? I just it the, broke up a little bit. The comparison I'm trying to trying to find here is what is more environmentally impactful: the upcoming threat of failure of a pipe, which, of course, it's 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 no, not I'm not trying to trying to minimize the 
the risk of a failure of a pipe uh, versus the direct impact of doing this work and the impact on the environment caused by the this action. Well, I would I would have to say, you know, as I mentioned before, our, our current way of doing these inspections is is I think it's extremely damaging to the environment. You know, as I mentioned before, we need a workspace to make sure we have the proper uh, laydown area and safe work area to do those inspections on the pipeline. You know, in terms of the excavations, um, you know, there's the cost to it, and I really think it's, I guess, the best way to summarize it is this new inline inspection will help us avoid having to do excavations over the pipeline in these wetlands every seven years for the future of this pipeline. So, you so I think, oh, sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so, so yes, there is an environmental impact to being proactive, um, but if we are not proactive, we will still need to do these inspections every seven years. And that's gonna be more impactful just in the aggregate of having to do these over the lifespan. So I know that we've discussed some, this is my last one, Bill, and I'll give it up. Um, the, there, there is a possibility of putting these pigs in the smaller line. Theoretically, would you be able to replace um, with a six inch line that matches the same size which runs underneath the wetlands and then run that system through the old pipe? Or does the entire pipe need to be replaced in order to install the inspection systems. So I'm just going to repeat this back to make sure I understand what you're saying. So if we use the existing smaller pipe size, would that be able to meet our needs for these tools is what you're asking? Is it possible to install an inspection system in an old pipe? It is. Um, but, you know, the 5.8 miles, there's about 3.8 miles of that that is 12 inch. The two miles that we're looking at replacing is a kind of a mix between six and eight. So let's say, you know, we did decide to go down to a smaller tool, but that would mean that now we would have to replace 3.8 miles of pipe in order to get that line uniform. Matt, if I understand the way that the tools work as well, um, we have a, a mix of the six and the eight, and you, you can go from one size down, but you can't go the other direction. So if you have kind of the up and down in the sizing, we don't have cur currently tools that can kind of expand and contract as they're moving through a pipeline. So I guess, um, can you, can multiple systems, uh, portions of this pipeline be inspected by different inspection systems? Could you just install the inspection system and then st you know step it down and, and until it gets larger again then you have the next section and you you would install a different system there and why can't an inspection system just be installed in the existing pipeline so i i think one of the things that i didn't really explain too much at the start is i did mention the uh the pig launcher and the pig receiver um they're both big barrels that you know obviously they're exactly what they sound like the pig launcher is where you insert the pig tool the pig receiver is where the pig comes out at the end of the line you can take it out and, and wrap it up so i i understand what you're saying could we kind of you know do the inspection in segments um but i think you're going to run into that situation where now you're going to have to you know have those pig launchers and pig receivers at every change of pipe diameter which i think is going to have a bigger impact overall because um, now you're going to have multiple locations where you're going to have multiple installations. And it's, it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's just tough for using those smaller tools because they are elongated. They don't go as well through any bends or tees. Um, and it just, it's that much higher of a risk of using a smaller tool that you're going to have to go back out and dig it up and, you know, get it unstuck for lack of a better term. Uh, would you like to follow that up, Brad? I've, just got, I've got a question. I don't want to lose my train of thought here. Go ahead. When is the in next inspection due, the seven year period? When is that? So I believe we just had one over the past couple of years. So it would be about seven years from now. Okay. So, I mean, in 70 years, it will be 2100 almost. No, uh, I mean, seven years. Seven years. Right. I know. I'm saying in 70. Oh, okay. Sorry. There will be only 10 inspections required in that amount of time. Do you really think we'll be running natural gas in 2100? Like the direction we're moving as a 
species? As society in general, um, you know, I want to I want to step aside here, and you know, this is my own opinion, but no, you know, I I definitely understand, you know, um, you know, renewable energy so is, it is the way of the impacting ten acres of wetlands for a seven year, you know, potentially only ten inspections. I would say yes because I think the safety is 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 worth it. You know, as 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 Shona mentioned before, we are doing you know um, you know reforestation and mitigation plans. You know, uh, the majority of what we do dig up will um, revegetate over the years, and I think that you know because these are just temporary impacts. Um, I think the long term safety aspects of this project do outweigh that. And you know, it, it, you know, like you said, in a hundred years, you know, your guess is probably as good as mine. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's one of those things where if we don't do this project and there is a safety incident, it's it's one of those things you can't go back on. And I think it just goes back to as I was talking to, uh, I think that was Brian. You know, it's just just it's being proactive. So I, I, you know, oh, yes, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I want Weston to finish his train of thought, and then I'd like to kind of chime in. Well, I'm just going back to Brad's point where you know you haven't seen any signs of failure, and to right. do this for a potential savings of only ten inspections before we move to 100% renewables or anything like that. But you know, I'm just wondering that. But Bill, well, go I, I got a question, Matt, and maybe you can clarify, because I understand you know, what my colleagues are doing here with looking at risk trade-offs. Um, and if I understand it correctly, I mean, at the end of the day, you're looking to go with a in-situ continuous monitoring device versus to do, having to do ex-situ inspections on a routine schedule, is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Exactly. So, so with that understanding, with this continuous monitoring approach with the pigs, you have the ability to more routinely detect the potential for gas leaks or safety concerns on along the line versus doing it intermittently on a routine schedule 10 times over 70 years and, and potentially having a catastrophic failure. I, I get it, you know, that, you know, that there might be a small probability of that, but you could make the same argument, like for a bridge, you know, why, why do we de design bridge for 50 to 100 year lifespans? You know, why spend that money up front? You know, why don't we just do it for 10 years? Why? Because we know we want, well, why do we design things to withstand, you know, 100 year floods? I mean, we do it because there's a, there's a economic cost and a risk trade off. So, you know, I look at it, I think the benefit of continuous monitoring and the ability to more have a greater likelihood to detect a leak from which we know if there's a leak of methane into the environment not only the potential explosive release of it but also the negative climate change impacts that methane has of being 20 whatever the number of times greater than carbon dioxide emissions are in the environment you know to me puts it the project in a better light and, and in me voting in favor for it versus voting against it, especially when one considers that the wetlands impacts are temporary, they will be monitored, they will be mitigated, and there's additional mitigation being contributed to the Clean Water Act 404 fund to prevent that could be used to offset uh, impacts. So at the end of the day, I think it's a judgment call in terms of how we wanna manage risk, but I'm convinced that this is the better risk trade-off. I know I'm getting a little, you know, liberal yeah. with it, but uh, I was just no, uh, it's all right. I'm I'm, making that I point. appreciate the questions. You know, um, it's just my thought. To I, I kind of would like to see, you know, some a better, <clears throat> a better approach to the seventy-five, to, you know, foot right of way. I think that there's better ways to trim that down in in many areas. I mean, you're not going to run into needing seventy-five feet everywhere, especially if you can get away with fifty in an upland. I think that, you know, you guys should consciously look at your geotech reports and everything and decide which areas you can bring those impacts down because 75 feet of tree clearing, you know, 10 acres of tree clearing. I mean, middle of wetlands. I understand that you don't want roots over your ga gas line. We don't want leaks. But for a 12 inch gas line or 75 acres of cleared tree, uh, 75 feet of cleared trees, you know, you don't, the roots aren't going to be anywhere near that if they're 25 feet away. I just, so. on, the, on the 75 feet, the, the extra distance on the edge, that's for emergencies. To get an emergency vehicle in or out or somebody out if there's, there's a safety incident or something. Is that right? 
Um, so the, yes, that is right, but it's also for a travel lane too. So I, um, I know that Shona took her presentation down, but in that visual, it shows, you know, the spoil pile, the trench, the, you know, the machinery that's doing that digging, you probably going to be a side boom and then that extra space. So, you know, if let's say we took out that extra space, then that means that your workspace is going to be spoils, trench, excavation equipment, and that's it. So there wouldn't be any way to yeah. get up and down, even if it's not an emergency, but just to have passing vehicles, just for the continuation yep. and, uh, you know, piggybacking of the moving the equipment down. For the, the leapfrogging, right? You finish one yes. section a certain way, the next one moves ahead and starts on that next section, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I would also like to add too, in terms of that 75 foot space, you know, you know, I think one of the big reasons why we, we were able to kind of reduce it down to that 50 foot um, uh, workspace in the highlands is also because once you get into the wet, at wetlands, as Sean mentioned, the, the, the soils are just much more unstable, especially working with that size equipment. You know, I, I know I've said it, you know, the reason for this project, but it's also the reason for the workspace is, is safety for the guys. The, the tighter you make that workspace, you already have unstable conditions to begin with. It's just going to be that much more of a safety risk for you know, the men working on site. Are you not doing well, geotech reports to, you know, decide how much you need, how many mats you need to put down or anything like that? I mean, you're going to know how many feet of organics you have and what type of space you're going to need. That's just my thought on it. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just taking notes. We do have survey of the area and um, we have discussed this, this issue at length. There's, with all the environmental permitting that we've done, we've ad nauseum discussed avoidance and minimization. And what it, my understanding was that it really comes down to that safety issue. And additionally, the dispersion of um, weight. We've got big vehicles that need to get out there and do this work. Uh, we need to disperse the weight. We need to have room for swing arms and travel. Um, and this was something you know we we discussed a lot in an effort to try and minimize it, and the safety really trumps um, everything else in that in the wetlands area, from from my understanding. But I know that there's engineering that's gone behind it too. Um, but we we do know what's out there, and and this was this was the best option that we could do. And with all of the mitigation that we are um, suggesting, that won't be the final impact. Most of this impact is. Yeah, I'll just say I kind of echo Bill uh, with the risk to, you know, to safety kind of going on here um, with the pig going through, you know, getting that constant readout, knowing exactly what's going on instead of every seven years, hoping that, you know, something didn't happen in there and checking it. Um, I see that as a, as a, as a win for, for the public, you know, as for public safety. And uh, like I said, it's temporary. Um, you know, these wetlands won't be impacted for the rest of the time that they're, they're going to be mitigated and brought back to where they were. Um, so I think it sounds good to me. I would respond to Bill by saying that I haven't made a decision. Um, you know, I, I don't need to paint this project in a positive light just for the sake of the proponent, uh, the, you know, the, the proposal here. Um, I need to ask these questions to formulate my opinion. And if we're gonna talk about bridges, um, yes, of course they're built for longer than 10 years and but we can inspect those um, you know, easily without excavation. Sure. Um, here, we, when we have excavated and we have found, we found no issues with the pipe. Um, you know, I. There have been repairs made. Okay, that is not what was said before. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We have like an online dialogue going on behind the scenes here, and it's hard, I think, when you were presenting to follow it. But um, one of the engineers is is confirmed that, you know, not necessarily major repairs, but during the excavations, they identify external repairs that can be, that need to be made and we make them. Um, the, the benefit of the pig is just a much wider range of, of detection. And I understand um, that, sure. And not excavating in wetlands and in other, in other areas, you know, every, every seven years. And additionally, we can, we can definitely um, use it more than every seven years. I mean, I think the benefit is beyond just the the required inline inspection every seven years. Sure. And, uh, and I'll note as well as, as part of the uh, our siting board application, there's a number of um, you know, sections that we, where we have addressed a lot of you know similar questions about um, the methodologies, you know how what size pigs and um, 
you know, what, what size line can accommodate the best available technology. So, we, you know, this is something that has been thoroughly vetted through, um, you know, through the siting board, through, I, I think we presented some of the same information to the, uh, to, to MEPA, to um, Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act uh, staff as well. Yeah, I should certainly hope that the questions I'm asking are not something you haven't already thought of. I'm sure that you guys have gone way them. well and beyond be anything that I'm getting at right now. So right. Um, I just I just know that um, we've got a lot of people here and um, many of them have the same questions in mind. And uh, we might as well get them out there uh, prior to opening up to the floor. So um, I'm good for now. Very well. Good segue. Bill? No, I was just going to say, I think Brad's comment, you know, unless you have any comments, Louise, I think it sounds like a good segue to see if the public has any comments. Sure. Uh, I know Mr. Dale had uh, raised his hand long, long ago. You have a comment? You're muted right now. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Dale. I'm from 350 of Greater Lowell. Uh, we've been looking at this pipeline <clears throat> in its several incarnations over the last five years. This is the third time the same project has been proposed, and I hope you understand that. Uh, each time it has had slightly different reasons for proposing it. The first time it was proposed was as an upgrade in supply capacity. Secondarily, at the time, it was safety, but the primary reason was for supply. So I'd like to just put that on the record. All the things I'm saying now we'll be putting in our a letter to you, which you'll be getting. So I, this is just sort of bringing it up to the uh, people from National Grid. Um, we think that this project is not sufficiently necessary to justify damaging wetlands. Uh, and that's why it's being brought up for this to this board is this board has the has the responsibility of protecting the wetlands. And so we're telling our opinion is that it's not necessary. Um, a couple of other couple of things about that in specific are um, I've done my own homework on this and there are inline variable inspection devices. Uh, and I have not seen that they are inferior to the straight line one, the uh, large scale one. The, continuous ones that they're talking about. So I would like to question that statement um, and therefore, and the proposed need for safety to have this larger continuous line. I don't think that that's really true. Um, it does on the other hand, give a fourfold increase in supply. That's uh, the second thing is, and I, I actually would ask, are they doing this safety, supposed safety upgrade for the whole rest of their network? Or is it just here where they want to increase the supply? The second thing is that uh, the major impact on wetland beyond going underneath two streams is around, a, is they have proposed, instead of following the current pipeline across the parking lot at the uh, movie theater, they propose going around the parking lot, which is all on the border of wetlands, all the way around for several hundred feet. Instead of just following the old pipeline across the parking lot, which wouldn't impact the wetlands at all. And I don't, I just don't think that they value the wetlands enough. I think they should, you know, I'm, I'm just not getting that this is, these are necessary uh, changes to, to, to for, for safety reasons. Now, as far as the increased supply, which was the original reason for this pipeline change, uh, Maura Healy several years ago did a study and concluded that no natural gas uh, improvements or expansion was necessary for the foreseeable future for Massachusetts. And based on my own feeling, of course, we're 350, we're all about climate change. We don't want natural gas. We don't think it's necessary either. So based on that, there's no reason to justify damaging wastelands for this purpose. That's, those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, is there someone else? Uh, Cormac, I can't see your entire name, but do you have your hand up? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I was trying to start my video. Um, I don't know if you want to unlock it, the host. Could you state your name, your whole name, please? Yep, Cormac Andres McCarthy. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, member of the Lowell Sustainability Council, and um, we've been following this uh, from the beginning as well the last few years. 
and we brought up um, a list of questions to National Grid in the past. Um, and I personally uh, called a few times and gotten some answers on a few things, but um, there's still a lot of uh, unknown questions. And like uh, Neil said, um, originally this was proposed as a an expansion to the amount of supply, um, which seems to have, um, you know, is, is, is no longer the reason. And um, and so it's a good point brought up, yeah. Um, so as the main reason for increasing the diameter and supply potential for this pipeline is to accommodate a larger inline inspection device versus a smaller one that seems to be a bit more difficult to use. Um, I'm not sure that it's um, warranted given the amount of effort that it takes to change over this pipeline. And since we are, um, since the city in general has this road to 100% uh, renewables master plan by 2025, um, by doing this preventative or proactive uh, approach of increasing the, the diameter and increasing the amount of supply, it seems to be um, very, very much against what the city is trying to do in general. And so um, if National Grid is increasing the amount of potential CO2 emissions via an increased supply and you know, subsequent incentives that I'm sure many of us and many of you know, family and friends have taken part of uh, you know, the um, new gas furnaces and stuff. Um, um, from switching from oil to gas, what will or can National Grid do to help mitigate the increase in CO2 emissions in accordance with uh, that road to 100% renewables master plan? That was it. Thank you. If, if I could get an answer on that. <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to uh, comment on this proposal? Uh, yes, yes I, I would like to. Uh, all right, Jay first then. Jay? Yes, could, could th thank you, Madam Chair. Could you uh, unlock my uh, screen, please? Um, hmm. uh, Joe, can you help me out on this? Jay, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. My name is Jay Mason. I live at 415 Pawtucket Street. I'm the chair of the Lowell Sustainability Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question and speak this evening. Um, the Sustainability Council was informed in March of 2018 uh, about the modernization uh, project affecting a 5.85 mile section of West Lowell along Route 3. We uh, reviewed the available documents at the time, including the ENR, the maps, the website. <clears throat> we ultimately assembled a list of questions to better understand the uh, dynamics and, and issues in, in the project. We wanted to know a little bit more about the demand that was mentioned, the risks and the opportunities. Um, unfortunately, those questions have not been addressed to date, but they have been presented uh, through, I think, the Conservation Commission, um, certainly through the city, uh, to National Grid, and I wondered if those questions had been received? Um, we, we did have a number of questions submitted, uh, and I'm, I would have to look back and... Yes. Louisa, we uh, I, I had sent them to everyone. We, we got a list of all your questions, Jay. Okay. Uh, I think Fran had sent them over to National Grid to make sure that they had them as well. So I could follow up with, uh, with Fran to verify that. Well, maybe National Grid can speak to that tonight. So we, uh, we did receive them. Uh, I believe we got the updated list. I think that was uh, Friday, this past Friday. Um, I know that there were a couple questions, well, more than a couple questions that you had asked in the past. I believe you sent those to us and uh, we were prepared to answer them. I, I can't remember the date of the city council meeting. Um, we did take that opportunity to update the, um, the project website that we had up on, under the facts section. 
Um, so it is, does not cover all the questions, especially because I know this last round of questions we got there seemed to be uh, there be a couple more, um, but that we did update the uh, the project website with a couple of those uh, those questions that you asked. Thank you, Matt. So if I went to the scope and benefits document, that should be up. Is that what's updated or something different? Uh, there should be an actual fact sheet. Um, I don't have it up in front of me, um, but it should be pretty self-explanatory on the website. Um, just getting up. Could you possibly put the link to that document in the chat? <clears throat> that would be ideal. And uh, I just wanted to say that given the safety and environmental concerns, uh, including the interest in protecting the wetlands and reducing the production of additional greenhouse gas emissions, the council wishes to request that we receive a full set of answers on those questions so that, and, and that we get a, uh, a contact that we could communicate with for any further coordination. That would be ideal. Sorry, just coming up. I, I definitely think that we could uh, we can take care of that for you, and I'm just uh, working on that link right now. Fantastic. And then, if I could, I I do have one question I'd like to ask. Um, it, it it is on the list. Uh, it has to do with pipeline safety, and you know, it sounds great that we have not had any leaks through this uh, Wilbur lateral. That's that's awesome. Um, it it is unfortunate though that we've got about 172 leaks in the city. And is there any way that this work, if it gets done, can uh, help us uh, understand and better deal with those leaks? You're muted, Matt. Oh, I am, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so you did ask about the 176 leaks in Lowell. Sorry, I was looking for that link. Um, and your question was, I'm sorry, this, your question was, how does this project kind of impact them or? No, if this project again? goes through, is there a way that the technology uh, being used in this pipe can help us? Uh, and the answer is probably no, but I have to ask, is there a way that that um, project could help us with those many leaks that we have around the city? So, no, I mean, unfortunately, no, um, you know, as I mentioned before this, this pipeline that we're looking at here is, is transmission. This project that we're talking about is transmission. Um, but those leaks that you're that you're talking about and discussing, those are on the distribution line. Um, you know, I do know that, you know, National Grid has a pretty uh, robust uh, leak survey group. I know they are constantly working on them, but I just I just want to make sure that that we're that we're separating out, you know, the two types of line as, as distribution is. Is very different in the way that you know it's it's it impacts you know the, the residents around and that the distribution line is is I don't want to say it's completely separate from transmission but it is a, it is a different entity. I'm sorry, I, I may be misunderstood you. I thought this was a distribution line. You just I believe said that it was a transmission line. Yes, this is a transmission line that for this project. Okay, so unlike the uh, distribution line that they had at the Columbia gas issues. Yes, yes, different than that. Okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, and I guess that uh, concludes my, my questions. If I can get those answers where I can distribute them to the council and we can answer them to the many folks who've asked up, reached out to us and asked us, uh, it would be great. I mean, the fact sheet sounds terrific, but if we could have something that, that addresses and we can show people hey, National Grid, listen to us. They addressed our questions. Here's what they gave us back. I think that would be huge. No, nope, completely understand. We can work with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Grossman, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, John Grossman, uh, 83 Barnum Ave. Um, also with 350 Mass. Uh, I have two comments and a couple questions. I'll be quick. Comment number one, if the concern is safety, I, it would seem in terms of the cost versus the benefits, it would make more sense to use the money to address the gas leaks that are currently existing rather than to um, replace pipes that don't have leaks. 
And then finally, uh, second point is that it's not just 2100 where, they, we, where we're imagining uh, 10 more seven year inspections. If we're not through with gas significantly before that, we have no hope of reducing, of meeting our Massachusetts global, our Massachusetts greenhouse gas emission reduction goals in line with the science. The only way to do that is to move off of natural gas significantly before 2100. So it's not a 70 year timeline we're looking at. It's a much shorter timeline we're looking at when we're comparing the cost benefit between making a long-term investment in a pipe, gas pipeline that we have to move away from. But now I have um, one question and then there were a couple questions that were asked that haven't been answered. I'm hoping they could be answered. Um, the question I have is, have the abutters to the project been notified about um, this application for a notice of intent? And if so, has it been in any language besides the English language? Sure, you want to take a stab at this one? Sure. Yes, as part of the uh, notice of intent application process, uh, specifically within the city of Lowell, we needed to uh, notify everybody within 300 feet of the of the project. Uh, the notification was sent out in English. Um, I will note that in as as part of the EFSC SB proceedings, uh, you know, we, we did have a similar sort of outreach, um, you know, of a similar size, and we did have um, we do have an outreach campaign that. Um, is also, uh, we had, um, excuse me, collect my thought a minute. The, uh, as part of the EFSB campaign, we, we did have some outreach and I know um, in some of the public hearings, we did have translators available uh, if necessary. So there, has, there have been attempts made to, um, to work with uh, other communities in Lowell in, in the Highlands areas that you know, might not speak English. No, I, I would I would hope that any mm -hmm. any required notification be provided in, in a number of languages because that's the nature of law. People speak those, speak those languages. Um, there were a question that uh, um, Neil asked earlier was why the decision was made um, to avoid the parking lot in terms of the um, replacing the pipeline, the, replacing the pipes. And what was the what was the thinking behind doing that when one could have avoided a, a fair amount of the um, damage to the wetlands by going by using the existing pipeline or the existing route? Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind hopping in and taking care of that question for you, John. Um, so the reason for that, as you noted, that pipeline kind of skirts the edge of the parking lot. Is that was actually a request from that. Um, that property owner. Um, they did not want us to, to continue having that, um, the existing gas line go through the center of their parking lot. So they requested that we move it to the edge. So I think that that would just be factored in by the, we urge the commission to factor in the relative merits of a property owner concerned about their parking area. And I know people care about parking, but um, parking is one thing and wetlands is another thing. Um, and then the second, the question that Cormac asked earlier, um, which is given the city of Lowell's commitment to um, moving to 100% renewable and re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, how is this project contributing to that goal, or is it moving us away from that goal? And and what what can National Grid do about that? or the uh, Boston, the, the company involved, what can it do about that? Shona, we did a, uh, a, a green, a, a CO2 emissions um, reporter study, didn't we, for this project? We, we did, yes, as part of the, um, the, the MEPA filing. We, we were per, um, required to answer some questions under the, the Global uh, Warming Solution Act. Um, I, I would ask if the commission would like us to answer this question directly as, um, you know, yes, a very important question and something that is was contained, but um, in terms of the, uh, 
is if, if whether or not this is germane to the uh, um, Wetlands Protection Act. Lisa, can I chime in? Good. Right. So, so I just um, on that because uh, I've been thinking about that myself, but um, I, I think, like I said at the beginning, I think you went through a very thorough alternative analysis looking at various criteria. And I think at the end of the day, with respect to the Wetlands Protection Act, what we try to do is avoid impacts to the resource. If we can't avoid impacts, we look to minimize. And if we can't minimize, we mitigate, correct? I mean, that's the tip, traditional process, avoid, minimize, mitigate. Um, I think you came up with a preferred alternative. I think that you feel like that found the appropriate balance between the different criteria. And that, you know, you had six alternatives and you picked one. Um, and I understand the rationale and I appreciate how you got to that point. You know, hearing the questions and comments from the public and, and some of my fellow commission members, what I'm curious of, is I know from my experience on federal projects, generally when you have a public project like this, then you open up to the public, you, number one, you know, at a minimum, respond to the competence and some sort of responsiveness summary. So there's a public document from the, the applicant, you know, in terms of what their comment is of record to the various comments from the public. And two, sometimes those comments are used to somewhat modify the preferred alternative, you know, based on, you know, community concerns or state or local concerns. And I'm wondering if this project and this process, is there an ability to do that? Because, you know, I for one, I'm wondering if, if maybe what we do is we continue this hearing to the next meeting and give you the opportunity to, at a minimum, respond to the comments that have been seen right, right As at the end of the day, these comments do help inform our thinking in terms of whether or not the project, you know, has truly found the right balance between avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to the wetland resource. That's just a suggestion. I'd be interested in uh, national someone's from National Grid's response to that as maybe an option to kind of make some progress, but also, you know, be responsive to the comments we're getting tonight. Well said, Bill. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on that bill a little bit, you know, um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, there's not a real effort to minimize impact to the wetlands here. I think that, you know, if we want to see a real effort, we would need topography, geotech reports, areas where they can pump it out a little bit to pass each other for, for safety. I don't think taking 75 foot swath of these wetlands down is necessary in my in in any respect maybe if they're in like 10 feet of organics maybe but you're opening up basically a highway of sunshine to this to these wetlands that are just going to torch everything if we have another summer like we did last you know that's just going to ruin a lot of good environment i think that you know we we should see some grading we should see some actual plans instead of just a yellow hatch over a green hatch. I mean, that's just, that's uh, rather unacceptable to me, I think. <laughs> 75 feet everywhere is unnecessary. I don't think that that's the proper way to address this. I mean, you're basically taking out the whole width of some parts of these wetlands from side to side. And it's very clear on the plans. Thank you, Weston. Uh, let me just uh, see if there's anyone else from the public that would like to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, I don't see anyone's hand raised. Uh, There you go. Marissa's got her hand up. Uh, not seeing Thank that you. person. Oh, Marissa. I'm right here. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Marissa DuPont. I'm at 208 Mammoth Road, apartment three in Lowell. Um, I just want to echo what Neil and uh, Neil Dale and John Grossman said. Um, I really feel like there's a lot of things that have not been considered here and not 
it's it seems to me that the wetlands have not been prioritized. I mean, when you're talking about taking out a parking lot as opposed to wetlands, um, you know, I understand that the movie theater needs a parking lot, but especially right now, the movie theater isn't even being used. And who knows how long COVID is gonna last. I mean, it's very possible that this work could be done if needed um, in that parking lot and not even affect their business at all. Um, and then if we're talking about getting to 100% renewable energy by 2035, I mean, that, that means that only two or three of those excavations would even need to be done um, to the current pipe to keep it up to the, its current capacity. Um, it, it really does seem like this is still the initial proposal that was given to us years ago where they're just trying to expand the pipeline and they're trying to get it done incrementally. This That's not what we want in Lowell. We want 100% renewable energy by 2035. Thank you. It would interrupt the um the COVID testing site that just reopened, which I'm very proud of our city councilors for getting re reopened. I think- uh, Okay, we, are, we, uh, are we reaching the end of the public comment here or are there people that, uh, that have something to say? All right, I think, I think we've, uh, we presented quite a few uh, concerns and and uh, different uh, opinions on the on the topic. Uh, I I do feel that uh, as Marissa just expressed that we didn't really have a, a close up look of of which uh, areas were really going to be affected. You know, it was a, a sky eye view of of the path of the pipeline. Uh, when I go out and uh, see huge ancient trees, for instance, I usually uh, fight for those and, and try to get a little bit of 10 feet this way or that way to uh, perhaps go around something like that that might be a, a valuable asset. Uh, someone did mention uh, uh, waiting for further information. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the wish of the... Uh, of the board here. I mean, I personally would like to see real plans. Like, I, these are not real plans to me. I don't see any surveying. I don't see, I just see polylines and hatching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, but, we uh, don't generally get a set of plans for a project this large. Yeah, 10 acres of tree clearing. Are you kidding me? Like, for, I don't see minimization as being uh, a goal here. I see maybe replication, a goal, mit mitigation, paying for it, but not minimization to begin with. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, uh, the proponents here, are, are more detailed plans available and, and weren't not just submitted to us or? Yeah, so we have a very large set of engineering drawings. Um, it uh, we'll have to see how we can pare that down to what is is in wool. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we could get that over to you. <laughs> uh, we we generally do get a set of engineered plans with a notice of intent. Uh, this is yeah, that's something we definitely need to see. Uh, how does the rest of the board feel about this? Or are we doing would, enough information here? Or, or I would, would definitely request that at any of the um, questions received in writing from our different community groups be responded to by, by National Grid, as well as any questions asked by the commission during this meeting uh, be recorded and, and, and responded to officially. Okay, is that a motion, Brad? Uh, Bill? Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, because I think, you know, I, I think the the applicant, you know, in good faith, you know, gave a a, a a solid overview of the project in there, and 
at a, at a macro scale in, in what they're intending to do in their thought process. So I would like to give them a bit of guidance in versus say, you know, asking, a, leaving it so open-ended that, you know, there's not really a, a path forward on answering questions. I kind of heard three or four major themes tonight and, and I, I would encourage the applicant, you know, either tonight or offline to kind of get some clarification because I, I think where we're landing is looking to continue the hearing to the next, to the uh, January 13th meeting and using the next month to, you know, as, as Brad put it, get a response to the questions that have been provided by the city and you know other stakeholders thus far, but I kind of hear from, from a, as a conservation commission member, I kind of see three or four themes. One to you know the, the whole process of avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to the resource, and we're talking about the wetlands. I think you're hearing that. You know, I I guess for one I'd say is I, I understand that you went through that process and I understand how you landed on your preferred alternative, but I do think you could probably provide additional clarity and detail as to why that is, you know, why you need 75 feet within the wetland area along the entire stretch of pipeline replacement, number one. Number two, I would say, you know, um, I think you articulated somewhat well, kind of the tr risk trade-off between in-situ inspections versus doing the routine ex-situ inspection every seven years. Maybe uh, further define that in your response. And then with that, you know, maybe, add an argument why you really feel like you need to have a universal uniform pipeline size for the uh, in situ pig unit. Um, and then um, I would say, is there an opportunity in light of, you know, maybe thinking about these questions and getting back to us, is there an opportunity to maybe modify the preferred alternative in an effort to kind of minimize some of the impacts to the resource? Um, that would be my recommendation to allow us to kind of continue the conversation and move the project forward um, and not getting it stuck in its tracks. Because I think at the end of the day, everyone's well-intentioned here. You know, we just have questions we want to have answered in an effort to try and in our own mind, balance up the risk trade-offs between public safety, protection of the environment, you know, both on a local and a macro scale. That capture it and I'd open up to questions if I sounded way too cryptic. Okay. Um, you know, if, if, if this is going to be continued, certainly that time should be used wisely to, uh, to answer and, and modify as, as many things as possible. Uh, you've heard the comments and, and, uh, it, you know, it is a it is a major impact on on a wetland area, and uh, perhaps there are some uh, modifications that uh, you didn't consider. I know, I know, costs were considered, and and time frame, and all kinds of other things, uh, materials, and so uh, maybe another look at that is uh, is. Uh, just what we need in, in light of the comments that have come forward. Uh, so uh, if, if, the, uh, if the board and the proponent are both uh, willing to continue, I, I would recommend that. Uh, continue at the request of the proponent. Matt and uh, Shauna, is that something that Yes, well, yes. We, we'll, we'll continue to the next um, meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to provide more information. We will regroup and solidify the questions that, I, that we captured here and maybe just confirm that list with you before we get into a, a formal response, make sure we're addressing everything. Um, additionally, I apologize if we should have been responding as they were being asked. It wasn't, it wasn't entirely clear and I didn't want to interrupt. So we can definitely get those in writing to you. Okay, well, thank you for being accommodating to so many uh, different questions from so many different people. I know, uh, you know, it's not easy to uh, anticipate what you're going to be asked sometimes. Um, we appreciate the, uh, the floor and the opportunity. Thank you. And you will be able to uh, request a, a recording of this, this meeting as well, if it helps you to recap any of the questions that you might have missed during the process. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that was actually a 
one of the things I want to make sure we did have is a copy of the report and just so we can review and get back to you I guys on these. I, I think we're all willing. I'm certainly willing to work, you know, through our environmental agent, you know, and communicate with you about folks in the interim so that, you know, when we come to January 13th, you know, we've seen progression from tonight to that meeting. Okay, so can we have a motion to uh, continue to the January 13th meeting? I'll make a motion to continue to January 13th That's on the right. request, request of the applicant. Right. Yeah, Bill, all yep. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. so the, uh, the hearing is postponed uh, or continued until uh, the January 13th meeting at each time we'll uh, have more information and another opportunity to ask uh, questions. Thank you for attending. Great, thank and, you very uh, much. We look thank forward you guys, to have a good night. Discussing it at the next meeting as well. As do we. Happy holidays. Happy thank holidays. You. Thank you. Everyone. You too. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, our, our meeting continues here for the for the board members. Um, we have a set of, uh, we have actually three sets of, of uh, meeting minutes, October 14th, October 28th, and November 12th. And our minutes guru, Mr. Lovely, has checked all of these over, yep. made his corrections, and uh, I think they're uh, perfected to your approval, right, Bill? It's so long as I mean, I'm for one would offer a motion to approve the the rivet the minutes as revised and then submitted in, in an email earlier today to Fran if you folks are okay with that. All well, second that bill. Great. Okay. So do we have a motion to approve all we can do all three together? I'll, I'll offer a motion to approve all three minutes. Um, you know, a, as modified and submitted in an email to Fran earlier today. Thank you. Seconded by Brad. Okay. Weston, second by Weston. Um, any corrections? Any further corrections? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Minutes, minutes are all approved. I was thinking about voting now. <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have to correct something, Brad. Yeah, I don't know about that. It'd be a lot of reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're down to the word adjournment. This is yeah. usually the quickest. Uh, the quickest motion of the evening before we even do that though i would just say joe i think i i think we owe it to the applicant to try and help them kind of cl clarify what we're looking for prior to the next meeting i'm talking about the you know the national grid project because the you know there was a lot of commentary yeah i'll be sure to talk with fran uh, about the meeting tonight um and give her a rundown of the discussion yeah, we, we certainly don't want to uh, continue that again, if, if at all possible. Yeah. It feels like some other projects I've worked on in my, uh, my other job. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. That's what I was thinking too, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> all right, offer a motion to adjourn. Motion made, seconded by Weston. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, thank you all and happy holidays to everyone. Merry Christmas Aye. and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Merry everyone. Christmas, everybody. See you yeah. next year. See you next year. <laughs> yeah. Bye. 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 It's a long one. <laughs>